Hey, what's up, Scott Balkan here with Imagination Creation Films, and today, well, it's Friday. It's another live stream, but it's also this whole interview live stream thing that I've been doing lately that I've been literally wanting to do for years, uh, but I'm really excited today to have a special guest, and we'll introduce him here in just one second. Uh, remember to subscribe to this channel and share it with all your friends. Remember to thumbs up and all that stuff. Uh, and if you want to support this channel, my links are down below. Uh, always just, you know, click on that stuff and, and, you know, you're helping out the channel. But now let's get to the meat of today because, well, we have kind of a, kind of an interesting guy here. So Philip Grossman, uh, if you, well, some of you know him, some of you may not. And you're going to want to know him because of the things he's done, the things he can do, the places he's been, uh, and the stories he's got. And I I'm telling you, this this stuff is, you're going to be glued to this. So uh, let's bring him in. Philip Grossman, sir. Hello. And uh, introduce yourself. Hi. How are you? Well, as Scott, as you said, I'm Philip Grossman. I'm an adventure filmmaker, adventure cinematographer, um, actually engineering my education. Um, I sort of started this, well, I started photography when I was 10 years old, I think was my first camera, 120 millimeter, 120 black and white, got a 35 millimeter when I was 13. And then my dad always did home movies and he got a video camera when I was in my teens. I started making home movies around then and uh, went to college, did the engineering route. Um, and then I've always been on the sort of the edge of the entertainment industry, worked for Ernst & Young and then Capgemini for a long time in their media and entertainment group, um, mainly on the technology and business side of entertainment. Um, and then in 2011, I, uh, my wife says it was my midlife crisis, uh, but instead of a Corvette, I decided to go to Chernobyl. I thought it was a once in a lifetime opportunity, went to Chernobyl, said, okay, I've done it. Uh, and since then, I've been um, over a dozen times now in the last 10 years. Uh, host, produce and host my own show on uh, Discovery Channel a while back. Done some stuff with the, lots of things with the United Nations around Chernobyl. And then it's just sort of grown from there, traveling to other unique, interesting places around the world. Wow. Uh, yeah, because that, that was one of my first questions I was going to ask if it didn't get asked beforehand mm -hmm. was, what made you decide to go to Chernobyl? <laughs> yeah, you know, I get I get asked that a lot. Uh, my wife's like, you really need to come up with a good answer. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> so the, the reality is, so I, I grew up uh, just outside of Pennsylvania, or just outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So I was 11 miles from Three Mile Island. Uh, I remember that like it was yesterday. I was in Mrs. Murray's third grade class when that happened. And they were calling people down to the office. And for the younger folk, that was the the United States' worst nuclear power plant accident, which does pales in comparison, obviously. Um, my family's from the Ukraine. Uh, we came turn of the century, uh, so I have a tie there. Uh, like I said, I was working, at that time, I was actually working in the hotel industry within technology and had a boss who I you know, adored and sort of was a mentor, and he decided to go chase his dreams and leave, and I was sort of a little depressed, and my wife says, well, why don't you take some time off and, and uh, go focus on your photography? I said, okay, I can do that. So I, you know, put my engineer hat on and said, what, what kind of project should I go and look at? And, uh, you know, I had to ask the question, why is Timothy Greenfield not as famous as, um, you know, some other photographers? And he's a, a fantastic uh, portrait photographer. And it's, and it's, you know, because of the things that he took versus what somebody else took. So I said, okay, how do I shoot something different? Like, well, I could go to Europe. Well, everybody's been to Europe. I could go shoot the Eiffel Tower. Eh, people shot the Eiffel Tower. I could go to the Himalayas. On a, it's a rock climber, mountain climber from from Scholastics uh, School. I went to school in Colorado, um, and it just so happened it was about the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl. I said that's someplace I've always wanted to go. So I started uh, doing research on how to get there. And in 2000, 2010, yes, yeah, 2000, right around 2000, end of 2010. Could have done that math, but I didn't want to. Yeah, do it. yeah. <laughs> And uh, it, it was not an easy thing to do. There were really no public tours at, at that time. They had they had toyed with some public tours for a little while, and then those sort of stopped. And so I, I jokingly say I met some dude on the internet. And that's true. It's now, you know, my best friend, Arik, 
Uh, and if there are people who are tuning in from the various uh, Chernobyl fan pages and stuff, might know who Arik is. Uh, but Arik's a good friend of mine, and he's the one I credit with, you know, helping me sort of get into this stuff. Um, and uh, so I met him, I sent him a note, said, you know, I'm going to go do a, a one-day tour. And his response is, one day's not enough. I said, well, okay, well, you know, what should I see? He said, one day's not enough. So he says, you know, sometimes I have room, I might... You know, he's, he, at that time, I think he'd been two or three times. And he said, I, I have room. I'll take a, a professional photographer. So I sent him my, uh, my, some of my images. And he said, well, you're a professional. Wire me $500. And, of course, it wasn't a Western Union, so I felt a little bit safer. Um, and I decided I went to, to Kiev a couple days early, and I'd never been to Ukraine. So I toured around the Ukraine and met him at 6 a.m., um, uh, at uh, the Hotel Rus in Kiev. We climbed into a van with him and two other photographers and a couple of military minders because uh, you cannot go into the zone without, they're not guides necessarily. They are military personnel who basically they're to keep you out of trouble and to keep you from getting into trouble. Um, and we drove up there and uh, it, you know, it, I couldn't have imagined what I was going to see when I was there. I was ill prepared. I mean, I thought I was prepared. I, you know, I had my equipment, I, you know, I'd done a little bit of research. I just didn't do enough research. And so uh, that it was funny because on the way to the airport, on that first trip, I get a, a, a text from Arik. It says, uh, I think we got permission to, to go into the control room of reactor number four, which is where the accident happened. And access, access he'd been trying to get access for quite some time, and he had not been able to. And he finally says, I think we got access. I said, okay. Um, he's like, it'll be $2,000. So detoured, went to the bank, <laughs> got out another $2,000. Um, and then he also said, we, we also might have gotten permission to take a helicopter flight within the zone, which is also a rarity. So on my first trip there, I, you know, toured a lot of places, got to go to control room number four, um, and got to fly in a helicopter over the zone. And I thought, ah, that was, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm, I'm happy. Never thought I'd go back. And two months later, he goes, um, uh, I get a con contact from Arik. He says, I'm, I'm going back. Do you want to go? I said, yes, but only if we go longer. So he goes, okay. Uh, so on the second time, it was mainly, okay, there's some things I want to fill in that I had photographed and I'm going to take a video camera with me and maybe shoot some more video stuff. And that's really what sort of started my film career. I mean, I had done hobby things for a long time, but this was, okay, I want to do something serious. serious. Although I didn't know what the story was going to be. And I've always sort of, Documentaries, by their very nature, are um, prejudicial. I mean, they're, they're, they're biased. It's a human being going, this is the story I want to tell, and they go and they tell that story. And I, I wanted to try and stay away from that as much as I could. I'm a human being. I'm going to have some bias. So I wanted to see what the story, what, what the area was going to tell me that the story should be. And so over the next three, four, five, six visits, it just kept collecting more and more material. It's where I started shooting, you know, 4K for the first time. I shot raw 4K for the first time, which I swore I would never do again. I uh, came back with 20 terabytes of material. <laughs> you know, it was cinema DNG. Uh, it was just, it was messy. It was actually, I was supposed to shoot ProRes. So I had gotten an Odyssey 7Q. Uh, the, the, the conversion design team was great. They let me uh, Odyssey 7Q and I had a FS700 uh, or an F700, uh, and they were going to get the ProRes. That, that's what they're going to have. ProRes. ProRes is going to be ready. ProRes is going to they're, they're working on the code. And they just couldn't get the code finished in time, but they said, we have Cinema DNG. I said, fine. So they, they gave me a few extra uh, uh, um, SSDs to use, and I literally you know, I had 20 terabytes of material I came back with. <laughs> it was just... Yeah, that's uncompressed too. So that's, that's, yeah. that's raw, raw, raw. Yeah. I said, I was never going to do that again. Never going to shoot raw again. Of course, you know, <laughs> fast forward to 2016 and that all changed when I got my first red. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of how it started. Um, and then it's just become sort of this quest to, to learn more about what happened there and the people and, and sort of document everything. And, and, you know, recently I've learned that, uh, you know, so they have forest fires every year in, in the zone, like, like California has forest fires. And uh, of course we get, um, we, we get, I get notifications from everyone. Oh, forest fire, forest fire. And I'm like, yeah, it happens every year. And unfortunately it does destroy some things. Um, and this year it really did destroy some things that, you know, unfortunately are just gone forever. There's a, this wonderful children's camp. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rest camp. Uh, a lot of children go there with their families and they had these 
hundred or so um, cabins with these brightly colored uh, cartoons on the side that were painted. Um, and it's just an amazing place to go. And, and those uh, individuals who travel there more frequently, that's some place that they will typically go to once or twice because uh, it's sort of off the beaten path. You don't really know about it. The main tours that they have now really never took you there, but the buildings are gone forever. Luckily, I have it documented in 4K and 4K raw at this point in time, and then you know hundreds of photographs from that area. And and for those of you in the audience, and there are quite a few of you, if you have any questions for Philip, just put them down there. We'll try to get to them as soon as as we can, or when they apply. We have literally hundreds of <laughs> of BTS photos to go yep. through here. You're going to get yep. to see some stuff you've probably never seen. In fact, I know you're going to see some stuff you've yep. never seen. Yep. Uh, and Philip's going to talk all through this so like while we're showing these um get those questions in there because uh, we'll we'll be able to try to get to them as fast as we can uh looks like we're gonna be about two hours today so we're gonna move kind of quickly so yeah. don't delay get those questions yeah. in there what let me know when you want to start through these yeah uh, we can start now okay you know? and like i said anybody questions i'll answer on technology on how i got there the cameras i use the history of the various places, what you know, I'm I'm an open book. I you know, I'd love to share and to teach. So, you know, I saw J Jacob saying hello yep. there. I know he went with you on an adventure. We'll, yep. we'll get to that one, I'm sure, at yep. some point. Yep, <laughs> most definitely. I think his pictures in one of these in one of the one of the oh, images perfect. I sent you. So, yeah, if you so want to start there, with yeah. number one. Yeah. So a lot of people ask, so how how do you get to Chernobyl? You know, and so um, you fly into Kiev. To get to Kiev is typically you know it's through. I, I I refuse to go to Charles. De, I, of course, I fly a lot. With, with my job, so I travel the world. Uh, I refuse to go to Charles de Gaulle Airport. Um, it's just, they make you take everything out of your bag. It just was a mess. So typically I go to Amsterdam to uh, British Bowl, which is the, the airport in Kiev. I go and stay at the, the Holiday Inn that's downtown because I'm the Holiday Inn person, I've got points. Um, and then I'll, I'll meet up with, with Arik uh, and we'll drive, uh, it's about, 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers, you know, 40, 50 miles. It takes two hours because the roads are not all that great. Um, and the first place you get to, so Chernobyl has, is what's called the zone of exclusion uh, or the zone of alienation. And it is this 30 kilometer radius zone around the reactor complex that no one is allowed to live in. Uh, it started off as a 10 kilometer uh, zone and then there was a 20 kilometer zone or 20 kilometers past that 30 kilometer zone uh, set up after the accident. Um, Didiatka is the entrance point. This is a picture of Didiatka, uh, where you first get to, and it, it's sort of scary. Um, go to the next image. So that first looks like Drew Carey checking out our papers. Um, <laughs> but that's what it is. You know, you get there and they, and they, you know, they want to see your papers. You have to have your passport. Uh, you have, they, they refer to it as the program, which are all your permits. Um, and they, you know, reviewed our permits and passports and, you know, took us into the zone the first time and it was, uh, it was gray. And, you know, part of me was like, Oh my God, it's going to be gray. The pictures, this is going to be awful. And it turned out to be just amazing. Cause it just provides, obviously flat lighting was fantastic. It just provides the mood. It's um, yeah, the mood. Exactly. Yeah. And this was, this was November. So this was the first time I went was right before Thanksgiving. So, and this was, uh, uh, the, the first place I stayed. Um, so I've stayed at multiple places within the zone. This was the visiting scientist, uh, facility. Uh, we, we jokingly say those are half twin beds. <laughs> um, it, it, and the accommodations got worse after this. this the, the visiting scientists uh, actually shut down. I shouldn't say got worse. But there was a period of time where they weren't not nearly as nice as this. And I don't think I have an image in there, but this is where they, um, uh, the visiting scientists stayed. This got closed down, uh, I think, in 2015, 2014. What was the Ministry of Information building in the zone was then converted into a residence and now has become known as Hotel 10 and actually has a little bar. Um, that's not a bad place to stay, if you, you know, and because tourism has picked up, it's hard to get access to that. Uh, so we usually will stay in Hotel Pripyat, which is, you know, from the 70s and it's worse than this. But, it looks yeah. like a child's room. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. So, so this was uh, the, uh, the magazine. The magazine is like a bodega, a little store. Um, there's a sign back there that says drinking is forbidden in the zone. And of course, you see the wall full of liquor. 
<laughs> so, and and it's it literally is collateral. That's how we get access to certain areas. Is just you know we carry beer, we carry vodka. Um, for people who are traveling internationally and going to off beaten places, a little tip. And I actually learned this. It's not my idea. I learned this, or I, I took the idea from um, you and McGregor film or documentary Long Way Round, where they're traveling on motorcycles around the world, um, and they had little airplane bottles of spirits. And I said that is so much better than because I used to take a big bottle for my military minder Sergey, who we've, who's taken us around for for you know a decade now. Um, I used to take him a nice big bottle. It's much better to take lots of little airplane bottles of lots of different kinds. And so uh, that's, that's, that's the best way to do it. Interesting. Well, I mean, yeah. it's definitely more affordable. To, to, yep. Oh, hello. Yep. Yep. So this, the very first, so this is the control room of reactor number four. So my very first trip to uh, Chernobyl, uh, we were given access uh, permission to go into this room. Um, we went and saw control room number two, and then we, we came and, um, it was surreal. You know, people said, well, what was it like when you stood in there? And it took me about 30 seconds once, you know, I adjusted to where I was and trying to take pictures and, and then it dawned on me where I was standing. And of course I, I had, I've got a Geiger counter, so I'm keeping track of this. And one question people always ask is, you know, what's the radiation like? Are you worried about it or not worried about it? Um, and so I have my Geiger counter on. I turn the, the audible alarm off. Um, standing in there for about 10 minutes, you get the equivalent of about a chest X-ray. It's, it's radioactive, but it's, you know, it's not uh, overly radioactive that you can't enter that. There are other places within the uh, reactor complex that are far worse. And you can see each, there's sort of these pods of controls. Um, the furthest pod is the reactor controls. The secondary pod, which you see here, is the pump controls, the cooling. And then there's a third pod that's in, further in the foreground that you can't see that is actually the controls for uh, the electrical output or electrical control of a reactor. So you have three operators and then you have a fourth person behind you. And so those who saw uh, the Chernobyl documentary or saw the Chernobyl uh, 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 I guess it's docudrama is the correct term for it that Craig Mazin did. You saw the individuals in there. Now they had a few more individuals because they had a trainee in there and they had the shift supervisor because they were running this, this uh, test. So this is a good question on, on no. your first visit where the reactors were the other reactors still running. No. So it, it the re so obviously reactor four shut down in 86 with it, with the uh, yeah, explosion. Event. Yep. <laughs> um, they continued. So the, the reality is there were two more reactors being built at the time uh, that would have brought them to six. And the goal was to have 12 reactors there. Um, and because of the way the Soviet Union worked, Ukraine was sort of that central location where they were going to have lots of power coming from. And so they needed to continue to generate power. They needed the power. So uh, reactor number um, two was the next one to be shut down. I want to say it was in 91 ish. Uh, and it was due to a fire. They had a fire in the turbine room. The turbines actually Go figure. used. Yeah, they used, <laughs> they used hydrogen as a coolant and they had a, a hydrogen fire and it was irreparable. And so they shut down reactor two. Reactor three closed down about a year and a half later. Reactor. Reactor one closed down a year and a half later. Reactor three did not shut down actually until December 15th, 2000. So it continued to operate for 14 years after the accident. Interesting. So this is me, uh, you know, stuffed into the, this old helicopter that they brought in. And it was, <laughs> so I have, I have a private pilot's license. I have an instrument rating, so I'm not afraid of flying in, in old airplanes because that's how you learn to fly right. in an old Cessna 172. This, yep. was a, this was a little scary. Uh, the, the, uh, they had the battery pulled out of the air of the helicopter, tr you know, banging on it to try and get it to work. Um, <laughs> Good Soviet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, we got, of course it was overcast, so we didn't get as clear an image as I would like to have of the reactor. And of course you have to stay far enough away. Um, but we did get some really good images of the reactor. So this is the actual reactor complex in, in um, I think it's 2011 or 2012. And this was out towards the, there's an area called the Pripyat port cranes, which is where the, um, uh, during the accident, they literally brought barges of sand and Portland cement and gravel, dumped it on the ground, 
mixed it on the ground with these cranes and the helicopters picked it up and flew it over and dropped it in the reactor. And that's the area I'm, I'm filming from. And you can see what's called the sarcophagus, which is this right. sort of that gray metal. You'll see the two yellow structures at the very end. Those were actually added, I think in 2000 to support, to reinforce the uh, um, sarcophagus. It's technically it's called the um, object shelter. Um, or confinement shelter. And it was built sort of off site and then helicoptered in and built as best they could with remote controlled vehicles. Um, so it's, you know, good Russian or Soviet construction is not great. Soviet construction in, you know, the middle of a, an accident is even worse. Uh, so this is actually uh, about half a kilometer away. This is the, I'm standing on the roof of what would have been reactor number five. So you can see the little person in the middle there is mean. So this building is pitch black inside. Um, no light whatsoever, you know, and it's, it was under construction. Nothing was finished. So trying to figure out what things are in there. It's taken me several years of visiting that building to figure it out. And I, my wife went with me um, in 2013 and, um, I've learned to, that the telltale sign of when my wife is worried or nervous, is she starts to swear like a truck driver. <laughs> we're, we're climbing up these old concrete stairs inside this building. And I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? Is everything all right? And she's like, go, God damn it. Just go. Just don't worry about it. F this go. I'm like, okay. Cause it's pitch black and uh, interesting story about this building. Um, so people always like, have you, you know, have you had any problems in Chernobyl? So I got held up at gunpoint once in Chernobyl. I had gone up onto this building to, we had gotten permission to stay in the zone after dark. I wanted to take photographs and video of the, of the sun setting. So we, went, we, we figured out through some apps that the best place to do this would be on top of this particular building. So I went to the building, went up on the roof, uh, shot everything. Uh, I guess I should also preface this, that this was in 2014, about uh, three days after the Malaysian airliner was shot down. Uh, so they were on high alert. So, ev yeah. yeah. So evidently they had, um, uh, snipers at the reactor complex and saw us on the building and they <laughs> sent them there. And as I came out of the building, I took, I took my time coming down off the building, got out of the building. All of a sudden there's guns in my face and the, the, you know, I've been studying Russian slowly and it, it, what little I knew snapped into place. And, and I, uh, and I saw Yana Panama Peruska, Ya Panama Angleska, Yo Panama Angleska, which means I don't understand Russian. I understand English. Do you understand English? And they put their guns down. They said, Da Nim Nogo, which means yes, a little bit. Took me to the vehicle. The, um, the, uh, um, Lieutenant was there, you know, in his thirties. In full uniform, hat on, big smile on his face. And I said, I'm, I'm going to take my backpack off. Don't shoot me. Please. Please. That's the only English he knew. So everything is the response. To everything was please. So uh, <laughs> we got back to the, we got back to the, this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, it's the equivalent of the KGB uh, SBU, I think it's what it's called. Um, they took us into the station. Um, or outside the station before I went in, I, they, they wanted to see things. And so I tried to convince them I was just up there with my iPhone. So I'm showing them photos on my iPhone. And unfortunately, there's a picture of the FS7 and the Odyssey 7Q. <laughs> and they're like, this, this. And I was like, oh. and so he goes in and gets like the, the, the kernel. And so my partner, I'm like, well, what are, what are you going to do? I'm like, we have to show them something. So I grabbed it, my GH4. I grabbed the Odyssey and I said, this, this is what you saw. And they, oh, okay. So they had no idea that the Odyssey was a recorder. Most people don't. So they took right. me in and I had to go through every photo on my GH4. And they're like, uh, this, you know, and delete, delete. You know, I said, well, I'll just delete them all. And they go, no, 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 okay. I had to go through every photo that was on there. And they made me delete photos of the reactor complex, which I don't really understand because I have hundreds of photos of the reactor complex. Mm -hmm. um, so then they let us go. We went back to the place we were staying that you saw in the photograph. And uh, of course, I just, restored everything on the card. So this is sort of the, uh, uh, the the staging area before I went to the higher point on there. You can see this large section cut out the roof. Um, over the years, they've come back in and just tried to take out th anything that was of value, metal, mostly metal for recycling. Right. And inside there was a storage area, had the, the robot, 
um, for refueling and some other things and they in the turbines and other things they just remove them for recycling and this area doesn't have a lot of radiation no so it, you know everybody goes what's the radiation like the radiation levels in this area are probably about the same as they are right here in atlanta interesting yeah now as you get closer to the reactor it gets worse and you can see there are some areas where i, I do suit up so this was uh I think 2012 ish or so. And uh, I went, um, was getting ready to go into the basement of the hospital here. And so the basement of the hospital has higher, it, you know, for those who saw the show at the beginning of episode two, you see the woman with all the firemen's clothing and she sort of dumps them on the floor. Well, that, that actually happened. And there is a room in the basement of the hospital where all the firemen's clothing still are. And that is very radioactive. So to give a, a, a a point of reference. Background radiation standing here is 0 0.2, 0 0.3 microsieverts. On it, and, and, and for those ahead. of you in the audience, uh, he was a participant in the show. We'll get to that one here in a little bit. Yeah, but he, he, his his work has has led to other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so again, point three, point two, point three microsieverts. If you fly on an airplane, it's actually three microsieverts. Right. The ba basement of the hospital at this time was there are areas that were well over 2,000 microsieverts, 2 to 2,200 microsieverts. Uh, so I did wear a respirator. And you see, I have a helmet on mainly because, and I learned this from, again, my friend Eric. I, I learned a lot from, about exploring from him. I could mount my camera. So you see, there's a small uh, um, Panasonic video camera on the side, HD small. little handy camera. <laughs> yeah, at that point in time, that was considered small. Right. And that's... And that's a custom built LED light I made that was uh, about 17,000 lumens and right. it's powered by a Ryobi battery. So that kept my hands free so that I could, you know, man, man the camera. Yeah. Nice. Oh, there it is again. Yep. Yep. So this is me um, on this. This is in 2012. They had just begun building the, what's called the new sarcophagus or the, the new safe confinement the shelter. Right. Yep. Um, and so this is the, they have the first sections of the arches built there and we were given permission. Um, the Varco is the, is the overarching engineering firm that manages the construction, um, and gave us permission to go on the roof of their building and go to the edge so we could actually film the construction site. Nice. Yep. Oh. Yep. So this is, yeah. The alcohol yeah. comes in. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I think is amazing is the people that I've met on all these journeys everywhere. Um, that's probably why I do it more than anything else. It's just I love to, to experience other cultures. Um, and so there are individuals who moved back. So everybody was evacuated from the zone when the accident happened. And over a period of time, uh, people moved back. I think at one point there were as many as 1,000, you know, 800 to 1,000 people had moved back into this area. And by the way, again, to understand the size of that exclusion zone, um, it's the size of Rhode Island. So it's not a small area. It's, it's large. I think it was 192 different villages were evacuated. Uh, so this particular village, this is Babahana, the, the nicest, sweetest old lady. She's lived there with her, her sister who is uh, mentally disabled. Um, and I think there's three or four other ladies that live in this village with her and one older gentleman. Um, and they were just, I've never met a nicer group of people when it came to strangers. They invited us into the house. They brought out... Um, you know, gherkins and lard and bread and everything they make themselves because there's not there's no shop. They don't have vehicles. You can see right. there's, there's one you know, fluorescent light bulb there in the ceiling. And she right. brought out this moonshine that she makes. I have never been so drunk off of two shots of anything <laughs> in my entire life. Um, and for those who there's CNN did a uh, some she used to work for CNN and she went off and she did her own documentary called the um, uh, I think it was the the you know the the um, resettlers. It was about the resettlers, and Baba Hanna is one of the stars of, of her particular documentary. So. Uh, let's see here. So this is this is 2013. So my my lovely wife Elizabeth, uh, you know, after coming back two or three or four times and telling her about all these things that I had seen, she's like, "Damn it, I'm going with you next time." which was great because I could take twice as many bags now right here. Um, and I had someone to help, help uh, carry this stuff. So, and I was, I joked that it was probably a mistake because now we're back in the States and she'll say, honey, can you take the trash out? I'm like, oh, I don't feel like taking the trash out. I want to Chernobyl with you. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Can't so, win that one yeah. I remember she, she, um, 
I, I explained to her, I said, there, there are no bathrooms when we're out exploring in the city of Pripyat. Uh, and so she found these things called magic cones, these little cardboard things designed yeah. for women so that they can urinate while standing up. And I got an email with the receipt in it. Nothing else other than one sentence that said, this better be effing worth it. <laughs> um, so we had, we had a wonderful time and there's a photo. I'll explain why it's, it's a very meaningful place to us. So it's also where I started flying drones. Um, in 2010, uh, I took the first drone, a little, a little, um, flame wheel 450 DJI. I was just learning about drones and decided we wanted something nicer. So this is an S 800. So I, as far as I know from talking with the various guides that are there, I'm the first person ever to fly an unmanned aerial vehicle in the zone. Um, my one friend who is, who's a guide there, uh, Nikolai Foman, not related to the engineer Nikolai Foman, just so everybody knows. Uh, but Nikolai actually was the guide when Top Gear went there. And so we were chatting the first time I met him. And I said, I think, we, you know, we flew a drone here. We might have been the first. He goes, no, no, no. I took the, the Top Gear guys. And we compared dates. And he said, I took them in X date. And so while we were here and Y date, he goes, oh, you were probably the first. <laughs> so was, we've got. Was it difficult to bring that in? Uh, so it's. It, 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 Yes and no. So that's no one knew what drones were. So for them, this is something that's brand cool new. <laughs> yeah, and I did get an S eight hundred, which that was one of the first ones that the arms could really, you know, yeah, fold up. up. And so I, yeah. I got it collapsed up. And when I first flew this this drone, my wife tells the story. Uh, my first accident with this drone was in my dining room. Uh, so <laughs> the old technology um, in. You know, back then, this is 2012, 2013, was if the remote lost c contact with the drone, it would go up 50 feet or whatever you assigned it and then would make right. its way back. So I had this on my dining room table and was checking things out and making sure everything was working and had the motors on and didn't think. And I shut the remote off. All of a sudden, I hear this <laughs> hit the ceiling, hit the wall. <laughs> You know, I did, you know, probably about $800 in damage to the drone before I even left to go to Chernobyl. So, um, and then my first true accident was actually with this drone in Chernobyl. Luckily, we jokingly say it was, let's see, it was the 15th day, uh, the 15th day of the month, the 15th flight, um, and something else 15. And it was that day that we took off and the drone lost an engine and, you know, crashed. So, um, I've had several other crashes there too. And this is, it's also the first year I started really focusing more on the documentary. So this is a, an individual, she was a teacher in Pripyat. And so we started just collecting it again, didn't know what the story was going to be, but I knew I wanted to collect stories about what had happened, what was going through people's minds, what have they done since then, and then be able to cut it in. And so this was the, you know, a, a lovely young lady, uh, who taught in the kindergarten, and people, people don't realize that Pripyat was a city of a, about 50,000 people at the time. Very modern city, the average, young city, the average age 27, 28. Uh, they were averaging about 1,000 births a year in the city. Uh, and very modern by Soviet standards. And they had, I think, 15 kindergartens or 12 kindergartens, the next number of secondary schools. And a kindergarten for them was actually kindergarten through, um, I think, fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade, sixth grade. And then it became more high school, uh, middle school than high school. So, um, so food and liquor, that is what gets you through there. So we were this, this particular uh, day we had gone out to, um, the Duga, which is this big radar array and there's pictures coming up of that. Um, and to get access, we were chatting, we took, brought a bottle of vodka, the guy who was the guard there. And this is, I think my fourth visit to the location. The first three we snuck in the First one, we got chased by Ukrainian guards. Now, luckily, it was late in the afternoon, and they'd already been drinking, so they couldn't catch us. But the gentleman brought out eggs that he made and sausages and, and, and juice and, and all kinds of stuff. And we had liquor, and we ate. And you know, after that, let us go in and spend a couple hours uh, in the Duga. Um, so there are areas that are much more radioactive and, and, and actually more dangerous because of environmental conditions than radiation. And we also didn't quite know at the time. So this is early on. This is me getting ready to go into the basement of an area called the Jupiter Factory. Jupiter Factory was a large factory on the outskirts of Pripyat. Where that was, the, the cover story is it, was, it made tape recorders and radios. And, and it did. 
it also made, it was dual use. It also made things for the military. <laughs> um, and when you go into the basement, you start to see those things and that no one was really sure exactly what was made there. And, and, and through my research and eventually when I did my television show, I got to meet a, a, a lady who worked there and she told me, she was in, a, in the accounting department, so she knew what was going on throughout the factory. And they made parts for intercontinental ballistic missiles within the factory. Yeah, small things. Yeah. Uh, yep. Question there, did you fly with any radiation uh, detection sensors? I, I didn't fly with any on the drone. Uh, it was early days, so we were lucky to get a camera on there. Um, and the reality is, so, so people understand how, how radiation works. So typically, the uh, radionuclides are attached to some type of dust. And that's what's in the air. And that's what you got to be careful about breathing in. Um, so at that point in time after, you know, we were 25 years after the accident there, rain, everything else, had pretty much settled all of the radioactive nucleides into the ground. Um, so you really wouldn't detect anything with the, with the helicopter um, or the drone. And I've had, I have friends who are, are, are scientists and, and uh, uh, um, professors at universities who actually study the wildlife there and stuff. And they've done uh, testing with, the, with drones as well. And you don't really get much of a radiation signal, signature because drones are, you know, radiation is, is, for those in, in the filmmaking world, it follows the inverse square law. It's radiative transfer. It just happens to be ionizing radiation versus, versus photons. So it falls off at the square of the distance. So if you're one foot away and it's a thousand, when you go to two feet away, most people go, well, it should be 500. No, it's 250 falls off at the square of the distance. So when you're flying at the drone, you're not going to see it. Just as a good question is how yeah. thorough is your cleaning process with your equipment after you visit the site? Uh, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so uh, for camera gear and everything else, it's usually fairly, fairly thorough. Uh, there's a story where I was with my wife. I oh, know I don't think she was with me on this trip. Um, I had been in the basement of the hospital, had my camera and I knelt down on the, ground um got up you know when you leave the zone you go through radiation checkpoint um uh little of village a little of checkpoint and you have to get out of your car and you go through this docent dosimeter which is a big gate you put your hands on either side they have uh, the measure around your knees and your feet and i go up in there and you know typically it, it beeps everything's clear and the gate opens it was there and my Sergei, our military minder, is standing next to me, and it goes off. And I look at him, and he, and he sort of points and says, use, use the next one over. So I go over, and I do it again. It goes off again. It was, it was on my knees. And he looks at me, looks around, and goes, go around. Just go around. Just go around. So I went around the gates. <laughs> There's like a little desk, and I climbed over the desk. And he just said, when I get back to the hotel, to wash my pants. So, you know, I washed my pants. It was actually also the same year that, um, again, everything's done through, uh, we'll call them location fees, location services. Uh, we were trying to gain access, and that's my, my friend Arix uh, Land Rover, which is an awesome vehicle. And uh, he had let the, one of the guards at one of the locations drive it because they love that car. Right. And uh, they drove it into a field, and you know, picked up sand and got radioactive material up into the wheel well. And again, we drove to the, to the gate and they check you, they monitor your cars as well as the humans and it set off the detectors. And we had a bit of a discussion and a bottle of vodka and just promised to, to come back Clean the next it. day. We went to a right. car wash and it got it cleaned up. So, That's interesting. Yeah. so people always ask me about the gear I take and how much gear and I, I'm a, I'm a, a propeller head. I'm a geek. Uh, I love gear. So this was 2014's trip. Uh, and so this is all the gear that I, of course, every year I say, I'm going to take less. I'm going to take less. I'm going to take less. I never take less. Uh, on average, it's about a hundred pounds or so because I'm limited to a hundred pounds or 50 pounds per bag without paying extra. Right. Uh, and then my backpack has usually another 50 pounds of gear in it. Um, in this case it was a, I think it was a Phantom three that we had taken. Also I crashed that one. That was a Phantom two. Yeah. It's uh, the Phantom two there. Yeah. Yeah. I crashed that one too again because it, Return to home feature set. Right. It was coming home, well, and you have to switch it out of return to home back into normal. With at that time, instead of it just reacquiring the signal, and it started coming down. I had I thought I was controlling it. I had no control. There's a piece of rebar sticking up out of a thing. Right. Hit it, and took it out. Yeah. They didn't have quite the recoverability of uh, yeah. the newer ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I and I, I again, I'm a gear hound. I love testing gear. There, there's no such thing as the perfect camera bag. 
Uh, although I right. think I've, I think I've come pretty close, at least for the type of shooting I do. Uh, the f-stop gear backpacks are just amazing. I have never seen one in person, but yep. they are one that I'm very interested. They're very expensive, so it's definitely yeah, they are expensive. The mountaineering bag, and the trick is, and of course, I don't know if you can, you can, I guess you can still do it. So, um, I'm friends with with Georgia, who who founded the company Trek Pack, Trek Pack, oh, and, which yeah. eventually was sold to Pelican. And right. at, the, at the time, uh, she still owned the company. I was living in Colorado, and I had gotten my my bags. And the nice thing about the F-stop gear backpacks is they have these things they call them ICUs, internal camera units. So these things that drop down inside this backpack. And I've got pictures further up that show this. Um, right. In each of the, one of those units, I outfitted differently. So I have one that's photography, one that's for travel, one that's for this one for that. And that the putting the Trek pack stuff in there really makes. That that bag, uh, the thing, a bit more rigid, which really you know Helps saves you the gear. Yeah, and so uh, if you, if you was, can, yep. Is that the Phantom on display at Atlanta Hobby? It sure is. <laughs> so I have to definitely thank that the guys at Atlanta, Atlanta Hobby, Cliff. Um, I couldn't have done half the things I've done with drones without that team. It was new to me. I you know I had a, a pilot's license. I knew how to fly airplanes. I had no idea how to fly drones. It's not the same skill set. Um, and they were the most patient people and have been very, very supportive. Um, they're experts, you know, and they, and they service people around the, the, the country and around the world, I believe now. And they were just very helpful at helping me get, you know, understanding how to fly the drones and, and keep upgrading to the next one. And I think I've flown just about every drone imaginable up right. through the um, Inspire one and then we've been flying mavics and mavic twos now mostly because yeah, it's easier they're, they're travel so good now. Yeah, yeah yeah so this is a shot so and this is somewhat of a rare shot now because this is the duga so there's this giant array uh, uh it's it's a stands for over the over the horizon radar array the idea was that they wanted to protect uh the soviet union from icbms and the idea was that they could bounce radar, radio waves off of the ionosphere and the trail, the exhaust plume of an ICBM would interrupt that signal. So they built this, and this is actually the listening side. Right. Um, there's, a, there's the transmitting side about 60 kilometers away. And then there's a lot of discussion. It's, it's 150 uh, uh, meters tall, about 550 feet tall. Um, I'm, of course, I'm climbing this building that, or this structure that has been, it hasn't been maintained since 1986. It's, you know, that's basically just rebar welded together to build the ladder. Um, the year before this, my friend Eric climbed the cooling tower, which I wanted to do, but my wife would not let me. That's even scarier. So when I went this time, my wife says, don't climb any, or don't climb the cooling tower. And I said, I, I won't. <laughs> so you I weren't specific, so yeah. So I climbed this, and it's the only place that at that point in time you could actually get a cell signal. So I'm up there. I took a picture, texted it to my wife, and the response I got back was "dick." <laughs> that was it. <laughs> she was not happy that I climbed that thing, as you can see. Um, and when you get up there, and the the the, the ladder I went up, the top of that ladder actually started to bend over 90 degrees. So I was actually not. I was climbing at an uh -huh. angle away from me. Um, when I finally got up there, you can't technically, you can't climb it. Somebody fell two years ago and died. Um, and so they've cut all the lower ladders. So you can't really get up there. There are ways if you're really crazy to do it, um, that you can get up there. That, so, that takes me back to my television days when we had to climb transmitter transfer towers. towers. Not fun. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Although that one does not look quite as safe. <laughs> Not nearly, although it was definitely interesting. And the worst part, oh, so you yeah. have these arms that stick out. Those things bounce. They probably go up and down four to five inches of movement on them. Wow. Um, and so I went out there with, with the, the, I think I was shooting, I took an, a Z100. It was Sony's first 4K um, ENG camera. And uh, I was working at the Weather Channel at the time, and we had some there, and I borrowed one and took it with me. Um, and it was just, you know. The, the view from there is just amazing uh, and scary. 400, 450 feet up there? What is, Five, 550 feet. 550, wow. Yep, yep. And my, my friend, Eric, again, he went, I, I got him a drone and when we first started doing this and he was learning how to fly it. He ran into that tower twice. <laughs> it's the largest object yeah, in the entire see. zone, and he hit it twice. And the U.S. has one of these too, don't they, in Alaska? Uh, so we have, we have something, the harp 
which was harp, design, yeah. designed for Virginia or something. No, it's, it's in Alaska. The harp's in, okay. in Alaska. Okay. It's high altitude radio detection or something or other. Right. And it, it's designed to detect the or to, to uh, uh, monitor the ionosphere. Okay. Um, and there's a there's another uh, installation about a kilometer and a half from there called the Krug, which was designed to basically test the ionosphere to figure out the, the level, because you know the ionosphere varies by the amount of solar radiation. Um, and they would use that information then to help figure out how to tune the, uh, the, the Duga, which is also nicknamed the woodpecker because ham radio operators, when it would operate, would hear this click, 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 uh, like a woodpecker. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah, so here's some gear shots. So this was in 2014 when I was first started shooting 4K. So that's the Odyssey 7Q. FS or F700, and you can. I, I always tell what year it is by how far along the arch is being built. And here I'm standing on top of a building known as the White House, um, which is was called that because the the um, Dyatlov, who was the head of the man, general manager for the uh, for the reactor uh, complex, lived there, and so they referred to it as the White House. Huh. Yep. Oh, there's some more. Yeah. yeah. And so this is uh, early morning. We decided we again gotten permission to go in early watch the sunrise, uh, get some amazing footage of the sun coming up over the city of Pripyat. That's that's a neat gearhead photo, actually. Yeah. It's, got, it's got artistry and gear. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. And so I'm getting better at what I'm wearing in my helmet and my glasses and the respirator and got the uh, Z100. I've tried, I think, every type of uh, modular vest, mole, mole, mole vest uh, imaginable to figure out what works best. Um, so if anybody's going, you know, uh, uh, exploring or, or uh, hiking and you want, you know, ideas on what's the best, this was the zip up vest. It's, I use that for a couple of years. I've gotten rid of that one now. There's a, a better way of doing it, at least for the way I shoot. But here again, we were preparing to go into the uh, basement of the, of the hospital, which I think now I've been in, God, uh, must have been in about 10 or 15 times now. And it's actually getting more difficult to access it because of the anniversary, the 30th anniversary coming up, they backfilled with sand all the exterior entrances into the hospital. There were other ways to get in. And then with the TV show and the increase in tourism, they've filled in more areas. Um, so I, I think we're going to find the answer to this question here shortly, but yeah. have you seen Reactor 4 since they've completed it? So yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll move along, and you'll definitely see whether I I, I know what's going on in there. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is you know a, a, as we learned more about what's in the basement of the of the Jupiter factory, we sort of stepped up our gear game, <laughs> mainly right? because we weren't really sure what we were running. And there's a lot of chemicals down there. There's, there's some really highly radioactive areas, and then of course it's something that for some reason over the last five years. They've had an abundance of rain, so that basement has flooded. So there's a, a foot of water down there as well. So I've got waders on. I got a Tyvek suit. Got my my respirator. You know everything ready to go into the the basement of the Jupiter factory. Mm -hmm. Here we are. So this is in the basement. Whoa. So this is one of the chemical rooms. And so when we, we we were looking at what was in there, we're like, this doesn't look like things you would def typically need for. Um, making radios and alarm clocks. Right. Um, so there were actually several experimental labs in the basement as well. Um, and then there's there's also a little bit of a disconnect. So we can always joke and say, ah, it's, they were making all kinds of stuff. But it, actually, after the right. ac after the Chemical accident, radios. yeah. Well, af actually, after the accident, uh, a, a company moved in uh, to, and took over parts of the factory, uh, and they were designing robots to clean up uh, nuclear accidents. So it's not so clear cut as to what rooms were for their work and what rooms were for, you know, the, the other work. But there are some that are definitely clear cut that they were for the, the experimental work. Have you had somebody look at uh, your footage there and see what the chemicals were? Yeah. And I've got closer images okay. and photographs and stuff we've looked. So here's, here's after that accident I told you about where the return to home, you can oh, see yeah, the bat your, your video yeah. transmitter. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and the batteries the in the back. Yeah, yeah, and the batteries in the back there oh, in the yeah. background. Um, the funny thing is, it still worked. The gimbal was shot; it just kept kind of going click, 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 click. But what, is I, that a clay pigeon? No, it's it's it, it, um, there are um, 
uh, uh, porcelain sure. things around. This is the train station. So there oh, were okay, okay. Uh, uh, high tension wires around there. So there's a little uh, porcelain piece from there. Yep. So this is in 2015. Uh, I went back and I, I had, I had, it's funny. So I'd You're sent it. You're a sound it, guy now. Yeah, I know. No, actually, so I, I sent, uh, in 2014, I sent some images on Twitter and I, and I linked uh, DJI, all right? Late, tag DJI and uh, um, Gabriel, who was the head of uh, uh, Gabe, who was the head of or worked in marketing or whatever, uh, had saw had seen the images. And he said, when I finally met him, he said it took them about a week and a half before they believed that they were real images. They thought they were fake. Huh. Um, and so that's where I first built my relationship with, with DJI and got to meet them. And in 2014, 2015, they sent a team with me uh, to film me making a documentary with drones. So they are making wow. a documentary about me making a documentary. So um, uh, uh, just a great team of guys, too. They were f fantastic. I'm still friends with, with many of them. And so this is a picture of uh, a, a, a drony, I guess you call it, me standing right. halfway up. You'll notice there there are certain portions within the the duga that you can walk the whole way from one end to the other, and that's where I'm standing. Is that one section? Wow. There are I think there are two or three of them on the way up. So I took myself a drony. Uh, oh, this is a swimming pool. Yeah, so this is the Luzerne, which is the the swimming pool, uh, which actually stayed open until. Uh, the late 80s, early 90s, I think is the last picture of water because cleanup crews and engineers, they would still use the swimming pool uh, for relaxation. Uh, what I'm doing here is I had just crashed into the diving board um, and it fell into the bottom of the pool. And so I had to go retrieve it. So that's a very steep angle. So I slid down in there, got down there, reset it, and it still worked. And this was a Phantom 4. Um, I had to use the, you can see the little two by four there to help sort of pull me right. up. You but didn't it, swim back up? You didn't. It, yeah, climb back up. And it continued. So it fell from the top of the, I guess it would have been the three meter board, five meter board, 15 feet up, I guess, five meter board, fell to the floor. I went down, got it, you know, popped the battery back in. I think my wife was on the side. She turned it on and flew it out. Um, <laughs> or maybe it was Paul Moore from DJI, who's now, you know, doing his own stuff. Um, flew it out. Comments. Say yeah. what you want about Chinese toy drones, but they're tough and good. <laughs> oh yeah. On that trip, we went with. So a funny story about that trip. So we, at that point in time, they knew what drones were, and so we had to have a permit to fly, and the permit took a lo location fee. We right. put on the we put on the permit that we had. They were they were Phantom threes. We put on the permit uh, one Phantom three and one Inspire one. Or we put Inspire, Phantom 3, Inspire 1, because that's what we were taking. And then DJI came along. Um, they had an, uh, a Phantom 3, and um, they had two Phantom 3s. And, uh, and so we're like, oh, what are we going to do? So we, we told the guards when they read it, because we wrote it in English. No, Phantom 3. Three, three. means <laughs> three of them. Inspire 1. One Inspire. And they went, okay. <laughs> so we, we went with them. That trip, we, we crashed two of the Phantoms. I crashed one. Paul crashed one. Paul works for DJI. Um, and we crashed all of them, actually. Uh, and and uh, my friend Arik crashed his. And then we made a Franken Phantom where he took all the parts from the ones that were working, put it together to make one one that continued to work the rest of the trip. Well, Luckily, the, the Inspire, we never crashed. I never crashed the Inspire. And, I mean, you've got to be resourceful because there's no store out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that's something I tell people. There's no Kmart. There's no CVS. You have to take everything with you. So my first, second trip when I took this new headlight with me, and I, you know, there, it's Europe that uses a different voltage. But everything I have that has a charger is dual voltage, 120, 220. Uh, my so charger for my Ryobi battery, not dual voltage. I was like, Oops. ah. And so I, I got there, I figured it out. I'm like, shit. So I, I got a cab, went down to what was sort of like a Home Depot type store. I'm using Google Translate to try and explain to them what I'm looking for. Had no luck. You know, I thought, well, Ryobi's everywhere. Uh, nope, don't have it in Ukraine. Um, they have rest of East, Western Europe, but not Eastern Europe. Went back to the hotel, sort of um, despondent that I didn't have the thing. I'm like, okay, well, the, I got two batteries. I'm just gonna have to really be resourceful in how much I use the batteries. 
And the, the uh, concierge at the desk knocked on my door at like nine o'clock and he had a transformer. They found me a transformer. That is I, nice. And I still have it today. They didn't charge me anything for it either. I'm like, you just saved my life. And it's that light that's on this helmet that you see. Uh, my 17,000 lumen helmet in there. I've got my GH4 on top of a, a Ronin. Ronin uh, yeah, that was a, the original Ronin at that point in time, which just came out right. a couple days or weeks before. It literally showed up two days before I was going, so I didn't have much practice with it at that point in time. But there I'm actually standing in the basement of the uh, – of the um, uh, or standing on top of the fireman's clothing. Well, what I notice in this photo is all the dust particulates in the air. In the air. Light. And yep. That, Which is why we wear the respirator. And that's the thing is that, it. so you have three types of radiation. You have alpha, beta, and gamma particles. Alpha particles, for the most part, are stopped by your clothing or your skin. Beta particles, you know, if you wear a heavy cotton clothing, you'll stop those. Gamma goes through everything. You need to wear lead. But the problem is alpha particles, if you breathe them in, and they're the lightest particles, and they're usually the most abundant, although their half-lives are a little bit less. Um, if you breathe them in, they have direct access to your cells at that point in time. So that's what you're really trying to do is preventing those radioactive particles. What about eyeballs, though? Uh, I have goggles on, so I do have okay. goggles on. All right, so quick question for you. Uh, we're about an hour in, and we're <laughs> only on photo 31. Do we'll you keep want going. To you want to pick up the speed, or do you want to just, just take it the same? We'll just keep going at, as you know, someone will go a little faster. Okay. But I mean, you know. at some point, you might have to hit the vodka. It's just you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I got you know my got my glass, and for my my Polish friends who may be watching or those who've gone, I've got my Zabrowska from Poland in its you know jacket. So, a friend of mine, friends from Poland, always bring these to me. So I love that stuff. <laughs> So yeah. now we're traveling with bigger cameras. Yep. So, sticks. yep. So I, I shifted over to um, the FS7, FS7 yep. on this trip, and then um, I, I, you know, I have to thank uh, ICANN uh, out of Houston. They've been a great supporter throughout this entire journey um, and provided me with with the larger sticks. Those are the Image uh, sticks, which are fan for the price. They are fantastic. Carbon fiber, lightweight, hundred millimeter bowl. Um, the head is is it's not it's you know it's it no looks, sackler or anything like that but it is a, it is a yeah it looks like it but it's not and it, but it works well although I, I've learned as I've started to add more and more stuff to my cameras that <laughs> it doesn't support as much weight or right. I should say I keep putting more and more weight than what the head was designed for it looks like a copy of the Compass Fifteen from yeah. Miller. Yeah. Uh, so, um, oh, there we go. So this is that that this was um, the. First time I got to go, and you'll see in, a, in an upcoming photo, into the actual reactor, but this is us inside the control room again, and I'm shooting with the FS7, and I think I've got the uh, the um, uh, Ronin with the Odyssey on there. Oh, God, that is so heavy, carrying all that stuff around. And you can't put anything down on the ground. We can't carry tripods in there because, again, oh. dust. Everything's about controlling dust because that's where the radioactive material is. So we couldn't put anything on the ground. I loved the Odyssey, but my God, the operating system of that thing was horrible. Yeah. To, yeah. to change anything, you had to reboot and reload. I mean, oh. Yep, yep. So we, we, I just turned it on and let it go. <laughs> oh, hello. Yep. So this is the first time I ever got into the actual reactor. So what you're seeing there, that big circle in the middle with the little uh, squares on top, that is the top of the physical reactor. So... RBMK 1000s, which is what this particular reactor is in, in the Soviet design, were so large that it's about 45 feet across. Um, U.S. reactors are about 20 feet across, half the size. These reactors are so large, there's no secondary containment structure. And that's the issue that they had. One of the right. reactions that happened is because there's no secondary containment. U.S. structures would have another concrete dome right. over this. Um, so access to this one, so I'll tell you, adventure filmmaking is not cheap. Uh, as I said, a lot of it has to do with, with uh, what we call location fees, but you know, let's, let's be honest, they're bribes. Uh, and it was $10,000 to access that back wow. then. Now for $250, you can take a tour and actually go. Really? Yep. Uh, but I, I see the powers on. Is that that's normal? Yep. Yep. So, because so the reactors were still they weren't operational, but they were all still being monitored. Being um, cooled. Slowly. No, all all the fuel. Well, we were told they were mostly defueled. That's not totally the case. But once a <laughs> reactor is shut down, and um, 
uh, for a period of time, you no longer have residual heat or decay heat, they call it. Uh, right. It becomes somewhat saved. You're no longer, so the control rods are all in, everything's in place there. Most of the fuel had been removed there, but they have to maintain, analyze, keep track of everything. And then over the years, um, they're going to uh, dismantle it. So reactor number one has just begun the process of dismantling. So decommissioning a nuclear reactor typically takes 20 years. Obviously, reactor four is going to take a lot longer than that, right. about 60 to 70 years. Wow. Oh. So this, this is why uh, Chernobyl is sort of special to me. So in 2015, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife decided to come. This was her second or third time visiting with me. Um, and while we were getting ready to go, she, we were, had gotten engaged and we were planning on getting married. Um, she didn't want a, a, a big wedding to begin with. And she said, you know, this has been such a special place for us. And the people we had met had joked about, oh, when are you guys getting married? When are you guys getting married? And we said, why don't we get married in Chernobyl? It's, you know, it, it's been such, it's, I, I start, in fact, she's the one who encouraged me to go. Um, if it were not for her, I probably would never have gone. And she, it's been part of our lives since we started dating. And so we decided that uh, we were going to elope there. And we contacted our, 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 you know, local contacts that we know. And they were like, they're fantastic. We'll help you get it all figured out and organized. They said, you know, a day before we were getting ready to go, we were, uh, my, my friend Ari said, oh, they say you have to have a suit. I said, okay, can I wear just, because I was just going to wear my regular gear that I wear. And they said, no. Um, and <laughs> I had to have a suit. I said, well, can I wear a sport coat? No, no, you have to have a suit. So a day before I left, I went to Joseph A. Banks. Cause I didn't have a suit at the time. I, you know, my, we, no one wears suits anymore. We were blazers and jeans or whatever. And you got three suits for a hundred dollars. Yeah. Yep. So I bought, bought a suit. They tailored it that night for me. I picked it up the next day. My wife had a dress. She had to go get shoes. She went and got shoes. So. We were supposed to do it at um, another church that's actually in Chernobyl that's still in the village of uh, Chernobyl that's still in place. But at the last minute, they decided not to let us do it. I, I could speculate why, I don't, I don't, but I'll leave that for right now. But this, you didn't bring enough gifts? No, no. It, it's more religious than anything else. Oh, um, okay. So this is uh, uh, St. Michael's. It's in um, Kresny, which is about five kilometers from the reactor. It's the only other church that's still standing. Uh, and the priest there said that uh, he would allow us to get married there. He said that there's been so much sorrow and that a wedding would bring is, some, is, yeah. is new life. It's, it's, the, yeah. it's the new life and, and bringing people together. And he wanted to bring that back to the village in some way. So my wife and I got married there. Um, we, you know, we had our own vows. We joked that there were more cameras than people because DJI was there. So we had cameras all over the place. And so we managed to uh, to get married in, in Chernobyl. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. That is. Yep. Oh, there you are. So and there's the the outside of the the church. We actually have. I got photo bombed by a drone. Paul Moore from DJI, you know, now doing his own thing, he flew one behind me as we're taking a picture. So I got photo bombed by a drone. So that was a, So we joke. It's a 200 year old uh, Russian Orthodox church. I was raised in a Jewish household. My wife was Episcopal. We got married in a 200 year old uh, Russian Orthodox church. So if that isn't pulling religions it's, together, yeah, it's, yeah. it's worldwide. It's exactly. <laughs> oh, so I'm this is see a red in here. Yeah, so this is 2016. So this is when I first joined the red family, as they say. Uh, prior to this, so this is uh, November time frame. So in October of that year, October ish, uh, September, I guess actually, I went to NAB as part of my day job, uh, and again, I said I was never going to shoot raw. And then, of course, the Raven was announced. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll think about this. And I was trying to figure out um, which red to get. And, 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 you know, those who are familiar with red at the time, there was just, you know, they had the, the epic and the weapon. And I, I couldn't make heads right. or tails. So I, I, I scheduled an appointment with the, um, uh, with the red guys. And on my way over to, to the red booth, I stopped by and I saw a friend, a friend of mine, Drew, from DeFi. And I said, hey, I think I'm going gonna to go talk to the red guys. I'm going to gonna probably get the raven he goes no no get the scarlet you'll be much happier blah 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 explain things to me like okay so i got over to the red booth and uh they're extremely nice you know walked me through what's going on they said look we're gonna have an 8k camera coming out in about two weeks go put your money down on a scarlet that way you'll be considered part of the red family and you'll get the discount for previous red owners i said great so i went back put my money down 
And they were fantastic, helped me through the financing and where to buy it. And because it was all new to me. And I got one of the first thousand heliums that came out. Nice. I did not turn the camera on. Well, I turned it on once, but basically didn't turn it on and use it until I got to my room in Chernobyl. Now, I did that on purpose. One is, and I'm still trying to write it. I, one of these days, I'll finish it, The Confessions of a Red Newbie. <laughs> I, work, I work with a lot of other cameras. I work with some of the, the Sony cinema cameras, so I was familiar with it. But I wanted to see how hard it would be. Now, I did RTFM, as they say, on the airplane. So I read the manual, so I was familiar with it. Um, if I had to do it over again, I probably wouldn't have done it that way, only because focusing in 8K is unbelievably important. <laughs> And what monitor did you have? Is that the, uh, it's a four the point, four, No, it's a 4.7. Yeah, that's that's the 720 monitor. Ooh. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, and it didn't have the, the, the peaking and everything else. So that trip, I have a lot of out-of-focus shots. <laughs> um, but I learned a lot, uh, and i just grown, and I sort of went from that. I, you know, I, I wind up doing the education, and I think I'm one of the fastest people ever to go from – buying the camera to doing education to becoming an instructor for, for red. Um, and they've just been a, an amazing company to be associated with Jared and, and, and all the people, you know, the marketing teams and the, the uh, uh, social media teams have just been so nice. I mean, I'm not David Fincher. I, you know, I'm not, I'm a nobody. I, I make, you know, a, a adventure films uh, and they treat me when I call or I have a question, like, I mean, like I'm, you know, one of those type of people. So it's just been a, a great experience. It's it's one of the things that that one of the reasons why I mean I love calling them a red family because they mm -hmm. just they're just yeah. good people. They really and, are. And when people go, well, red fanboy, red fanboy, I'm like, to some extent, but it's it's you know, if the technology didn't do what I needed it to do, and one of the reasons I got it is because I'm I'm still at heart a stills shooter mm -hmm. and I love video, I love the stories you can tell with motion, but you know. Doing things in 4K and getting an 8 megapixel image just isn't good enough. The 8K image is a 35 megapixel still, so I can shoot my video and then pull out the stills I need. Now, I have learned that you really do have to, it, it's, you have to play some mental gymnastics and you gotta think about things a little different so you have your shutter yeah, speeds emotion, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But it saves me from taking two cameras with me when I go to travel. So, so this is uh, some of the second shots. So, yep, so this is inside the, uh, and I love, Again, to me, it's like it's like uh, um, not Tinker Toys. Uh, what was the the um, the metal version of Tinker Toys? Uh, erector sets. Erector sets. It's like an erector set. Yeah. Being able to slap things on that I need oh, in man, different mics. Old. Yeah, I know, I know. So this is in <laughs> inside of the uh, cooling tower. One of the two cooling towers that were never finished. Uh, this one was the most complete. And if you stand in the very center of it and speak, it echoes oh, all around you. Oh, it's amazing. I've heard that before. This is wild. Yeah. Uh, and those of you uh, out there in the audience who may be considering a red, I would highly recommend you go for the seven inch monitor or go with an oh, EDF. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I now, focus on 720 on 8K. Ooh. No, I, I now have the ultra bright monitor. Oh, nice. And, and won't go back back tomorrow. Hopefully, I'm, I, I live in Atlanta. I'm one one mile from the VA and the uh, blue angels and thunderbirds are flying over the VA. Yeah, we, and so, ours is Sunday. Yeah. So I'm going to go down and, uh, and, uh, there's a parking deck there. Um, and I talked to the VA today and they said, I can go and access that. So I'll be right almost at rooftop with that, with the hospital itself. And that ultra bright is going to come in so handy. I, I gotta, I gotta do some research tomorrow, uh, on where to go. Cause yeah, I want to, I want to get some of that. That's, yeah. that's Cause I, lo I love shooting airplanes. I, sh I was supposed to go shoot a bunch of air shows this year and just couldn't. And this, this is why I love the red. I mean, the dynamic range of yeah. that camera, you can see the detail of the clouds in the sky. And of course this is a reduced JPEG and you can still see all the detail. It's just an amazing that, that, you know, Graham, I think I saw Graham on here early or earlier. The, uh, R3D is just an amazing codec. Um, yeah, it, capabilities. It's so versatile. Now, is that so? It's it's got a green hue to all the concrete. Is that moss or, or algae? Yeah, growing yeah, there? it's a, it's a moss that grows over everything, uh, and it's slightly radioactive. But again, not not you know you're you're not going to die by touching it. Don't lick it. It's yeah, not. yeah. You don't want to ingest it. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, and okay. so this is this is interesting. So this is actually, I think he said. Dutch a Dutch graffiti artist um, that uh, did this photo. So this is a, a, a an image, and this and there's a lot of graffiti that's been happening in the zone. Some of it 
you know, there, there's sort of the two schools. There's the the stalkers, the people who go in there uh, illegally, um, you know, because they want to go and investigate, and they're doing like sort of the tagging type um, graffiti, which I don't agree with. And there are others that that have done stuff like this. Uh, maybe he's actually I think he's he's from Belgium, um, the artist, and he did this. This is a, a, a rendition of a photograph that one of the original photographers who came to to photograph in the zone. Um, uh, Igor, um, God, his last name is just escaping me. It'll come to me. But this is you know, it's just a, 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 a famous photo of a doctor just being stressed, you know. And he he paint. I mean, it's it's. And I like it's, art that looks like a photograph, and this just does. Yeah, so, it's very photorealistic, but it's yeah. huge. Yeah. That's, oh yeah, I think it's giant. That's twenty feet tall easily. Oh man. Yep. Oh. So, so this is a uh, Cafe Pripyat. So on the on the northern edge of the town, this was sort of the hub, the 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 place everybody came to to socialize. It sat on the river. There's a um, a um, uh, boat dock there that they would have these hydrofoils and other boats come up from Kiev with people to the city. So there, it, Pripyat was known as a nuclear city. Now it was they used that term in general, meaning that it was used for military as well as um, um, non-military purposes. This was one of the few that wasn't a closed city, meaning you could go and visit. You could not live there without permission, but you could go and visit. So people would come up. And this particular Cafe Pripyat has these amazing stained glass windows. And you can sort of see some of the detail there. It's made out of slivers of glass that are seamed together. Um, I have a photograph I took a couple of years ago where at night, and I, I had those giant LED lights and lit those from the inside so you can sort of see the actual stained glass. Wow. Yep. And this is, that's a still from the red. This is also a still from the red. So this is inside control room number three. And again, you can sort of see the, the three panels across there. Um, the paperwork, which I think there's a close-up coming up, is actual the paper. This is the last reactor to shut down, so it's the actual paperwork from there. This is reactor number uh, or control room number four. And again, this is a, a still, 35 megapixel still taken from that red, right. and semi in focus. So this is the first and maybe the only 8K image inside reactor number three. <laughs> so this is the first one. I, in fact, I sent I sent Graham a still because God, this color is just off it wasn't this image is a different image and i sent it to him he's like man i don't know what's going on because he thought well, maybe he had the wrong setting for the for the uh um, filters on it or you know but nope it was just the lights and the color it was just off wow yeah so this is sort of where i began well i guess i got held up at gunpoint earlier but this is where i started my life of crime <laughs> <laughs> so, so technically I have just crossed into Belarus. So I'm standing in Belarus across the border uh, between Chernobyl. So Belarus uh, is, is about 10 kilometers from the Chernobyl uh, nuclear reactor. And what most people don't realize is that 75% of the, of the uh, stuff that ejected from the reactor, the radioactive material, landed in Belarus. Um, and through my work, I eventually was given access. I, I, I had a show at the... Um, at the uh, United Nations, I met the, the equivalent of the Secretary of State. They call it the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Belarus. He helped me gain access to go to Be Belarus and visit. And this was actually the trip we were going there, but we went to the border within Chernobyl or within uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, just outside Chernobyl. And this is me crossing the border illegally. Uh, have you done any 360 VR images? So I, I yes, um, there are. I've got about. 30 or 40 that I created um, with the Osmo. So I had the Osmo with the X3, I guess, on it, the, the, right. the, the um, four thirds. The egg. Yeah, and I made, well, no, I did I did them with the with the X3, or X, was it X5? Five. Yeah, five, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a bunch of those. I experimented with some other cameras. There's actually a guy who has done an amazing set of VRs. He lives in the Ukraine uh, and sent some amazing VRs. If you go to my, um, my Facebook page, I have them on there. There's a great page. I think it's hidden. Miriam will have to remind me if people can search for it. But there's a HBO Chernobyl fan page, uh, and I've posted some there. And I'll post throughout the throughout the week uh, coming up next week a bunch of the VR stuff I've got inside the reactor and inside the Pripyat. So I wanted to say, so I don't just do abandoned places. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say this does not look Russian. Yes. Yeah. Just... So this this is. Um, 
as I've started to, to become a better filmmaker and learn more about things, I've sort of tried to push myself. And my, my day job is in the television industry and technology. And it's enabled me to travel around the world. And, and what most people don't realize is you can actually rent a helicopter for you know a couple hundred bucks an hour, uh, depending on the helicopter and what's in there. But a Robinson 44 or 22 right. without the door. Uh, so in this case, I, they had a sort of a, a, a was it Kent? Kenron that makes the the gyros, I believe it's Kenron. Uh, someone those, can correct uh, me. Little orb eggs. Balls. Yeah, so they had yeah. two of those on this sort of bungee contraption, and I stuck my red on it. Um, and I even would, that's difficult in a Robinson. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It was at R forty four, and it was difficult. But we got to fly around. I was in in Australia working on a project with nine and seven, which is the equivalent of like ABC and CBS in Australia, um, and just went out for a couple of hours and. You know, took these, and again, this is the reason I got the 8K Red is because this is a 35 megapixel still. So not only did I have motion images, but I also have still images. And so this is the uh, Olympic Village, if you couldn't tell for, uh, I guess you couldn't tell it's stadiums, but this is the Olympic Village in, in uh, Sydney. Right. Yep. And this is, you know, flying over the city. One of the things I learned is that unlike U.S. laws, they can't fly at night. <laughs> I guess you have huh. to have special permits to do that. So we, we got as close to sundown as we can. So I got the ubiquitous shot of the Sydney Opera House and flying over. And again, that eight megapixel, or excuse me, 35 megapixel still right. pulled from that red that red image. Amazing. So this is just circling around. This this actually comes from the concept. So um, oh God, I just name just slipped my mind. Um, not Leo. Uh, still photographer. Uh, I'll think of it in a second, but he came and spoke. Elena has a great Elena celebrates photography and uh, he came and spoke and he had done this image around uh, the Empire State Building what is it famous for. He's actually a red shooter now. Um, he did a lot of the stuff over in New York City. Why can't I think of his name? And I'm following him on Facebook. Oh. Yeah, it's um, you'll, you know him. Uh, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and he did a lot of stuff with the 5D originally when it came oh, out. Oh, you're talking about uh, uh, in California? Uh he lives in California now, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Well, oh, come on. I know exactly. I, just, I know exactly who you're talking about now. Yeah. So if some yes. of the audience that you could remember popped it up there. Oh but, my God. Clue us in. We're both old. Yeah. Have you seen your moments here? Exactly. Uh, so he did this thing around the Empire State, but I'm like, that's such an amazing. So every city I go to, curious. I go. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I go and do this ion. I try to do that oh, same iconic. He's gonna thing. hate me. I know. <laughs> I know. I'll think of it in a second. I'm just so, had a baby. Uh, Vincent. Vincent Lafour. Vincent Lafour. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he sort of, and I have to give him a lot of credit for me really pushing my photography because I wouldn't listen to him speak. And I said, I can do that. He was, he was very giving with his information. So I, I, I'm very appreciative of that. Yeah. So, Sorry, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're getting old. You know what it's like. You know, and this is a, so that this is on the opposite side from the Sydney uh, uh, Opera House, the bridge there. So earlier that day, I've cro I crossed that bridge two times in one day. Because earlier that day, I went across the bridge to try and, you know, one of the things about, you know, adventure filmmaking in general, um, and any filmmaking, is you really have to um, figure out where you're going to shoot from. And you don't always know. And so if you have the opportunity to, to, to sort of stake out location scout, do that. And so I had that opportunity. So I walked across the bridge. Um, I found this area. And then I thought, wow, the sun's not down yet. I think I can make it back to my hotel, which is on the other side of the bridge, get all my gear and walk back before the sun goes down. So I did that. And I have some great time lapse from this side as well. And that's the the QE2, QM2. I get them confused, but that's the, oh. the I think it's the Queen Mary 2 was in right. port there and it left that night. So I've got, you know, uh, images coming out. My my wife's father-in-law loves cruising and he was on there as well. Um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and we give uh, Justin Kirchhoff the virtual prize of the day. Yeah, for forget that. Yeah, he's, he's the, the delay is about 30 seconds. So he was typing it long before we said it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he gets full bonus credit for that. I'll give him credit on mine. So, okay. So now we're starting to get outside of what was originally my comfort zone, Chernobyl. I've been to Chernobyl 12, 8, eight 10 times before this shot. So this is Teratem. This is Kazakhstan. This is the village right outside of Baikonur. Baikonur is the cosmodrome in, in, in Kazakhstan. It is a closed city to this day. In fact, technically, it's Russia. Even though it's in Kazakhstan, the Russians lease it. They use the ruble inside 
everything's written in Russian, so it is technically Russia. So this is Kazakhstan. So this gives you an idea of the types of places that I like to go. Hmm. And so to get here, this is, it's not an easy place to get to. So it, it is a flight from uh, Atlanta to, um, uh, I didn't fly to Ber Berlin, I flew to, flew to Germany, and I'll think of it in a second. And then from there flew to um, the uh, capital of, of Kazakhstan. And then from there got on a small plane, uh, small plane, it's a commuter jet, flew an hour and a half south to um, uh, um, Kislorda, it's the name of the town. Uh, again, they have flights out of Kislorda back to the capital city, uh, Astana, once every two days, I think. Um, and then it's a three hour bus ride to, to Terratem. Wow. So this gives you an idea. So this is my, I'm getting my bag ready. So that is, so I mentioned earlier that I use the F-stop bag. So that's my F-stop bag. Um, got my sleeping bag at the bottom on the other side, there's another bag of some other stuff. There's this, um, internal camera unit that slides inside. There's a picture of it coming up. I think that has the camera stuff in there. Um, and so this is us, you know, packed up the bag. That was the hotel. We, it took us two or three days to figure some stuff out because technically where I'm standing now, I have broken into a Russian military base. <laughs> Oops. Yep. So we spent a couple of days in Teratem contacting locals, finding out the landscape, you know, where the guards are, that kind of stuff. And then we began this hike. This is a, the hike is about 20 to 22 miles, depending on there's, there's four ways you can enter into where we're going in Kazakhstan in, in, in Baikonur. Um, and this particular way is about 20 or 22 miles one way. So we're about halfway here. Um, this is the this is actually a uh, demolished, blown up intercontinental ballistic um, um, uh, missile site silo. So as part of the Salt II treaty, the Russians had to blow up their silos, and this is one of them. Because most people don't realize Baikonur, you know, was a cosmodrome, but it also was a testing site for intercontinental ballistic missiles. Actually, that's where, what it was before it became the Cosmodrome. And so this is where we're, we're hiking. And I've got about 65 pounds of gear on my back with water and food because I have to have enough to survive for three days. And this is where I, I keep, you know, for those in the red in the red world, this is why I want a Komodo. Because carrying, <laughs> and this, the red camera itself isn't too heavy. It's the five or six batteries I had to carry with me as well. Um, and I used, you know, the blue shape has been great. John Morgan from blue shape has been a wonderful friend and, you know, and helped me with, with issues and ideas and, you know, and the, the whole team there. And those batteries are still, you know, they're tiny, but they're still heavy, you know, carrying six of them, plus the red, plus the lenses, plus sleeping gear, plus water, because I have to have enough water, it's about seven to eight liters of water minimum. Um, now we are smart. We get there and we actually leave some water at that location because that's halfway back so we're not carrying it all with us but we have to carry it all to that location and we lighten the load a little bit well, this segment is brought to you by blue shape battery <laughs> <laughs> no, john is john is great and blue shape yeah. is truly great They're definitely my favorite battery yep yep and, and as a segue if anybody wants a discount on blue shape batteries a good discount that i cannot disclose email me and i'll send you the details it's all good. Yeah, they, they are a great battery. I mean, they, they their run times are pretty consistent. Their little web app is fantastic. Um, so this is actually, so I have a thermal cam that I take with me because as we're walking across this barren you know, desert at night, I got it. There are military patrols. And so I caught the, you know, the two of us, uh, my, my friend and myself, and uh, we usually try and go with at least three people. There are four on this particular four on this trip because they have to each take turns standing guard uh so i have a thermal camera uh as we're walking across the desert at i'm night. starting to get a feel for how you operate it's probably similar to me is that you're always looking at your backpack going my god i carry too much stuff you yep. finally slim it down you're like oh i could put more cameras yeah, in here yeah, exactly <laughs> well the one, i think the one trip to chernobyl i had four or five different cameras uh five or six different battery types because of the drones it was just a madhouse right. now I've, I've really slimmed it down after doing this for over a decade now to the red and its batteries the still camera you know it's usually a canon 5d mark 3 or mark 4 its batteries and that's it 
you know, and then there's the thermal camera, a GoPro or, you know, something like that, depending on what's out there. And then what, when the new Komodo comes, I've already decided it's going to be going to get the R5, going to have the Komodo. Yeah, that's a and, powerful combo. Yeah. Right and of course, it lightens my backpack. So what am I going to do? I can now put my Ronin S in there. <laughs> Since there both those cameras will fit on the road in us. There you go. So this and you this, don't have to worry about that because the battery will last all day. Yep. So where I'm standing now, I'm about a hundred meters or so, two hundred meters from the hangar in the Baikonur Cosmodrome where the Soviet space shuttles have been sitting for thirty some odd years. Hmm. Now the interesting thing about this picture, you see the little white square about the center of the picture. Right. We stood there for about 20 minutes with the camera out trying to figure out was anybody in that building because we know there are guards we've, we've heard of other people getting caught and we thought well maybe someone's in that building and that's why it's white is hot and the reality is that building was just in the right angle and was hit by the sun and it was just warm from there there's nobody actually in it but we stood there for you know 23 and and i've made this journey now twice the second journey i made it was just two of us which we probably shouldn't have gone with just two people. Long story. Um, at this same point, my legs started to cramp up on me. I thought I wasn't going to, it was like, and this is a, about midnight, one o'clock in the morning that we're approaching this. I thought I wasn't going to make <laughs> I had so much gear with me that I just couldn't continue walking across the desert any further. Huh. So this will give you an idea of where we were. So that big gray building, that you saw in the in the previous thermal image is the building in the in the right hand corner. So that's the hangar. The building to the left is about thirty stories tall. That's actually a test facility for the equivalent of what's our what's our center booster rocket. They call it the Energia. We uh, after filming for a day in that building early in the morning, you know, before the sun rose, had to walk from that gray building to the other building in the left corner where the Energia is to film in there. And it's wide open, and we are obviously concerned about running into guards and all kinds of other stuff. Interesting. So this is to give you another set of view. Um, so the, the road that leads in from the corner, the lower right-hand corner, that road leads out to the main highway uh, that runs along this area. And that's where we uh, – I'm standing in the upper – uh, upper part of that bill or someone sitting in the upper part of the hangar always with a uh, monocular looking for anybody who's driving that road because guards turn onto that road we have about three minutes from the time they turn onto the road to head to the hangar before they're in the hangar so we all wear radios with earpieces so that we can right. you know you know communicate with each other um and keep ourselves so that safe. building on the left is the the hangar that we're going to see here shortly correct and the bill well you'll see both the building on the left is where the shuttles are and the building on the right is where the energy the, F is. The sense of scale here is so off. Yep. You, those buildings look so tiny right here, and we're going to find out just how tiny they're not. Yep. Yep. Oh, right. Yep. So this is looking just beyond those buildings. This is the launch pad um, for what would have been the N1. It was originally the N1 rocket, which is the equivalent of their Apollo mission, which never launched, had four failures. And then they reconstructed it and launched the, the Energia and Buran. So the Soviet shuttle program um, had, had two launches. It had a, a, a one launch with the Energia, the booster rocket, uh, and a military payload of some sort that they were testing. And then the only actual launch of their shuttle happened in November 15th of 1988 uh, from this launch pad. Launched, did two orbits of the Earth, and then came back down. But this would have been the launch pad. And this is, again, about five kilometers, six kilometers from that. I did not uh, know it ever actually got off the ground. Yep, yep. It was an interesting design, very much uh, identical to yep. ours, except for one thing. They took out the engines out of the yep. space shuttle. Yep. Which gave it so much more room for payload, and then the, the shuttle was larger, too. Yep, yep. That's wild. That's just another. That was actually shot from the top story of the uh, Energia building back to the building where the Baron is located, just to give you a sense of scale. And that building is, I think, 12 stories, 14 stories tall. Wow. Oh. Yep. So that is the shuttle. So there are two in this particular building. The one up front is a test demonstration or an engineering mock-up, they called it, for testing um, 
ergonomics, for testing locations, for testing radios. There's one behind it that's known, it's nicknamed Pachika, OKC2, uh, which is the act was the second one designed to go up. So the first one went up in October, or excuse me, November uh, of 88. It was unmanned. And this is, so there's actually, I'm, I'm, I'll, you know, I guess I can talk about it a little bit now. I'm working on a new television show potentially that we're pitching. Uh, around Cold War era stuff. And one of the, the themes is talking about a program called Line X, which I learned about when I did my Chernobyl show from um, Tom Reed, who was the um, uh, uh, who was the Secretary of the Air Force under Ford, then was an advisor to Reagan during the Cold War. So this Line X program, well-known program, they came, they sent the Russians, the Russians sent spies to the US to basically steal uh, military and industrial secrets. Um, we found out about it. Instead of rounding up the spies, we went and put back, um, gave them fake information, fake plans. We worked with Texas Instruments and a bunch of other companies. The shuttle was happening at the exact same time. By the time that the Russians found out about what we had done, we had pretty much polluted their military industrial complex. They didn't know what was real or what was fake. Tom supposition is that's why we actually won the cold wars the russians couldn't start over again so this this is was happening through the the middle of this um this the shuttle program and so a lot of people say what's an they stole the secrets the exact same copy and that's possible and that's what i'm going to one of the investigations it's also that they um their rocket system is very different their energia and their shuttle are two separate units they don't Work, they work separately from one another and they can work together. Our shuttle program was all one unit. The booster rockets, the tank, and the shuttle vehicle itself is one complete system. Theirs was two separate systems. So they have some differentiations. And one of the things I found is the, the Russians are amazing rocket designers. They're the Soviets, the Russians. They're not that great at aerodynamics. <laughs> And so they, they effectively, what they were concerned about with the shuttle is that it was for, the, the biggest issue for them was the shuttle would have 30 ton payload up. More importantly, it had 20 ton payload back to the earth. So if you're going to make space-based weapons, you got to get them back to earth in case you need to repair them. That's what they were concerned about. So that's why they built this thing to compete against it. Um, and so they, 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 you know, did they steal our plans and, you know, and use them as the basis? Possibly. Did they just see them in, in pictures and, figured it out, reverse engineer it, possibly. I know there's a, an airplane of ours that they copied that they saw the inlets, the jets had veins on them, movable veins. They didn't know they moved. So when they built theirs, they put them in there, but they didn't move because <laughs> they did it from a picture. So that's something that we're hopefully going to investigate. Uh, the question here that what network is your show going to be on totally on it gets pitching right now. So you don't correct. I don't know. We, you know, one thing I've learned it, it, through this process, it's, it's, it's one of my friends said slow motion, Russian roulette. <laughs> so we're, we're hoping that it gets picked up. I think it's a great idea. We've got a lot of topics to cover. Um, everybody during this pandemic has watched everything on every channel. So people need new content. Um, so, you know, right. I, Okay. I see my, my, my wife is commenting. She wanted me to remind people that the reason she went is so that she could carry more of my stuff. It <laughs> <laughs> was the first time I took my wife to NAB. I said, that's fantastic. Here's a backpack. <laughs> yep, exactly. She's my Sherpa. <laughs> uh, exactly. It's, it's like, um, uh, how, long, how much time did you have to shoot between guard rotations? Um, so on the first trip, we probably had... We had several hours between guards. We had them, they came in the one, so the one time they came in, you know, and, and I have a little bit of a military background. My friends have no military background. They were rambling on on the radio and I had to teach them, you, you don't say a lot on the radio. You, you know, just like airplanes, you say where you are, who you are, where you are, and where you're going, that kind of stuff. So I had to tell them that if you see them turn on, if, if someone's coming down the main road, say on the radio, approaching, and then don't say anything else. If they turn on to the side road, say hide, hide, hide three times, and then don't say another word. And they did that one time, and we, we scattered. And I'm literally, the, this building is built as two separate buildings, one inside the other. And I'm in between the two walls, just sort of going, and I can hear the guards talking. And of course, I'm thinking, okay, if they, you know, my friend reminded me, uh, Arik again is on this trip with me, and uh, 
uh, he goes, this is Russian territory. This is Russian military. And you're an American. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the first trip we had a couple hours in between, which worked, which, which was great. And we spent two and a half days between the two buildings filming. The second trip, it was just Eric and I, and they were guards. They, they, they sort of, I, I don't know if they knew we were in there or thought that we were in there, but so they came in, they spent a fair amount of time walking around to the point where, you know, I was up at the top looking and, and Eric came up. And uh, we saw them, you know, go into this other building. Um, and Eric said, you know, go get your stuff, pack it all up, and we'll move it up to the highest level because the likelihood of them going to climb to the top of this building is, is nil. So I went, grabbed all my stuff, you know, got it up to the top floor. And then Eric went to go get his. And I'm talking to him on the radio. And I said, okay, they, they finally left. And Eric comes back up without his stuff. I'm like, where's your stuff? He goes, you told me they left. I was like, oh. So I had to carry all my stuff back down to the place we <laughs> were staying. But, you know, so we, we didn't have as much time there on the second time shooting. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, we spent some of the time in the, in the next building as well. And then you, we would go to sleep at, you know, so there's no power, you know, we're, we're limited with what batteries you brought with us. So we have to keep track of all that plus food and water. Um, and so we went to sleep about, you know, it was winter time, November, so it was freezing. I, I've really learned to, Every time I travel, I'm trying to reduce the amount of weight. So I'd gone with a 30 degree bag or 40, 30 degree bag the first time. And um, this time in a, in a air mattress. And this time I'm like, okay, I'm going to lighten the load. I'm going to go with a camping quilt, which is basically a sleeping bag without a back. Right. Um, and, uh, or I won't know at this time I went with a 40 degree bag, but I, I took a space blanket just in case. Well, it turned out to be colder this time. It was October versus April. Um, I almost froze. I put this, the, the, the space blanket on because I couldn't sleep. That kept me warm, but then, of course, you sweat and blah, blah, blah. So I've, I've learned since then, and there's some photos coming up later with other visits I'll talk about, but I've really sort of managed to figure out the best model for keeping myself warm, dry, and not carrying too much stuff with me. Well, so. I mean, that's where you put your Epic W in your sleeping bag. You turn yeah, it on, yeah. watch some footage for a little bit yeah. to heat things back up. I'm waiting for, I forget the name of the company now, but they make this thing called the Hot Pocket, which is basically a sleeping bag stuff sack that um, – has a uses a USB based battery to and 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 I think it's carbon fiber oh, or something to heat your sleeping bag and then you can yeah, unzip yeah. it and use it. I'm like, I'm buying one of those. Sierra Designs, I think, is the name of that company. Right. Yeah. So this, yeah, this this shot here shows how big that hanger yep. is. So they have two shuttles in there, and the way it works, so the shuttle when it normally comes in here, they will bring they'll, they'll prepare everything in here. They'll bring the, and I think I have a shot later on of the transport vehicle. Uh, they'll bring the Energia, which is the, the rocket portion of it. And then they'll lift that whole shuttle up inside this building. And I think this, the, the name of the building, it translates into hazardous materials servicing building. <laughs> and they'll put the rocket down on top of it, they'll put the shuttle down on top of it, and then prepare it. And then it backs out on train tracks and goes out to the, uh, to the launch pad, which is, again, five kilometers, three kilometers away. So you can just see how big it is. And again, this is why I love the red, the amount of dynamic range. Right. People say that, oh, it's not good at low light. This isn't a hydrogen. This is the helium. And there's there's no electric light in this. That's all natural light coming into that building. And I think I'm shooting it at my favorite lens is this, the Canon 16 to 35 uh, Mark III F2.8. Well, that was yeah. a question, right? Um, somebody asked what, well, let me find, find it. Uh, about lens choices in the yep. red ecosphere. Yep. So I, I'm a Canon shooter, love Canon. Even I was talking with Jared the other day. I was doing an interview with him and I told Scott I screwed it up. The audio got screwed up. So I had two hours. So it's never going to be published, but I had a great time talking with him and with, with the, uh, Phil, Philip Holland. And he's a Canon shooter as well. And I love the Canon glass. You know, I'd love to have cinema lenses. But uh, one of the issues I have for me with a cinema lens is because of the type of shooting I'm doing, you have a 300 degree focus throw. That's too much for what I'm doing. It, for cinematography, for doing a, a feature film, I understand it. For the kind of work I'm doing, I want a much shorter focus throw. I'm actually sort of interested, I think, was it Sigma has some of their lenses have shorter focus throws. So I'm going to look do. at those. Yeah. But again, the, the cinema lenses are robust, but they're also heavy. So for me, I love to take every lens possible. My go-to lens on this kind of work is typically that 16 to 35 uh, 
Canon EF. The Mark the Mark III is fantastic. Um, I'm looking at the was it Lawa has their 12 millimeter. That oh, may, the, the be, super ultra wide. Yeah, yeah. So that may be the next one to take it's, along it's with tiny it. Too. Yep. Um, I mean, I'd love for somebody to invent that eight millimeter to 300 millimeter f 1.2 short throw. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. <laughs> Need to uh, get you in touch with Kevin at uh, Lawa. Yeah, that 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 was an amazing lens, and with some of the stuff coming up, because I shoot in small, well, typically small places. This is a large place, but I want to get that sense of size. That lens just looks, and I and I've gotten the point. It's, it's funny, is I, I know in my 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 photography career, uh, when I started when I was younger, everything was on auto. And that's how you learn. Everything's on auto. I right. do nothing on auto. Everything is on manual. Right. And it was sort of the same thing when I got to motion pictures. It was, I need everything to be auto for me because there's so much going on. Um, but as I've learned and gotten better at it, there's no longer that. Need. Everything's manual. And even it got to the point that focusing for me is manual because I don't want the camera changing its focus. Right. Um, but of course, focusing tools, red coming out with, with peaking was amazing. I'm really interested to see what this this uh, the face detect auto detect face. Do you have any face. photos with humans in the space shuttle area? Uh, uh, no, because okay. we're we're always so, watching things. Sure. So just to give everybody an idea how big this is, if you look to the left of that wing, way you can see a set of double doors. As as that should give you the scale of how big this building is. It's gigantic. Gigantic. And there's yeah. one on the right too. It's, yeah, it's yeah, and running up and down the stairs to the to the crow's nest is is tough. I got to work out. <laughs> and this, you know, people, you know, a lot of times people ask you, do you have a favorite image, a favorite shot? This has become one of my. I don't know why it is, but for some reason, I just love this shot. It reminds me of Star Wars, aliens. It just, you know, there's so much texture, color, depth of field. It just, there's yeah. something that draws me into this image that I just, I love this image. And the muted tones of Russia. Yep. Yep. Oh. Yep. So there's that sort of that close up of the, of the cockpit. Um, you know, I think, I think there's one, people always, will always ask me, did you get inside? Did you get inside? Stay tuned. <laughs> oh, yes, you, you got did. Inside. So again, one of the differentiators between the way their shuttle is designed and ours is it's two story. The the cockpit area is two stories. The upper stage where the is only two pilots. I think in the U.S. there's three upstairs and there's four downstairs. And so this is this is in inside of what's called the Chica. This was the one that was being prepared to actually be the next one to launch. Originally, it was supposed to go up in ninety. And this is why I sort of think that they found out about what we were doing in the middle of this is that their first flight was in eighty eight. Their next flight, which was going to be this unit, wasn't scheduled till 91. So, you know, almost four years later before they're going to launch their next flight. Hey, look who joined there. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, this, this is some amazing stuff here. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, more. And so this is this is in the, the, the mock-up unit that's on the other side. So it actually had more things. You can see the screens in there. Of course, they won't work. They just had blue paper or painted blue. They were testing, using that unit to test where to put the radio equipment, where to put the gears, where to put the controls. Interesting. Yep, yep. And so this is the airlock. So this is on the lower level. As you walk into the back, you walk into this airlock area, and then you can either go up or go out. And so in this particular one, the back door was it has bolts that screw in. There's no way I was going to undo those bolts. <laughs> but, but, but never fear. The next shot, I think, we got inside. Um, and to I give you an idea of, that? so that's inside the cargo bay. Okay, so that's the hat. Okay, that's the yep. And so to give you an idea of how big it is, in the upper right hand corner, there's oh, a there's human. A person. There's a human being. Wow. That's my that's my friend Mikhail from Poland. So shout out to Mikhail if he's on. Uh, but that gives you an idea of just how big the inside of that shuttle bay is. That is amazing. Yeah, and of course, there's no lights in it. <laughs> so, right. You know, and so this is, again, me standing up. And it, it, of course, like any other photographer, I've tried every single tripod imaginable and what's the best for right. weight and, and uh, you know. Simple and, carbon fiber, tiny, yep. and proto. Yep, and my, my latest one is, is the uh, iFootage. 
I really love that, you know, this one was all Manfrotto, carbon fiber. I think that's the C700 or CX700 or whatever it was. Right. Um, I'm now, I, I'm in, I've, for this kind of work, I fall in love with Manfrotto's um, Nitro, the N8, that yeah. nitrogen one, because it gives me such flexibility and I can lock things down and make things smooth. And I've gone, you know, sans ball head and i've gone to the iphoto because iphoto makes a really small compact uh um tripod that has i guess you call it a uh, um oh, what is it a uh um, hybrid so it's got like a quarter ball head on it it's flat but you can put the your tripod uh mount on it your head on it and then it still has a quarter ball head to level it out and it's and it's i use it on my last two trips and i love it because it's tiny lightweight but yet it's robust and gives me the, the height and length that I need when I'm shooting. So and are, and most of your, head. are most of your shots in like this, are you just doing them locked off or are they you, you handheld or? So most of this was, it was handheld or excuse me, was locked off um, mainly because, you know, I, I can't get really good. I, you know, I don't know if it's old, I've got Tourette's or what, but everything looks too jiggly to me. Right. Um, I love, I have some stuff where I've either used the drone and walked with the drone for footage. Um, I did the helium. I shot some stuff here in the helium and I got the Osmo three or whatever it was for the, the, the phone. So I have some helium 3d stuff that I shot in here, uh, the, on the second trip. Um, if, if the show takes off or I find out, you know, if we just, we're, we, we were supposed to be, we were actually supposed to be in Chernobyl in May and, and, Back to Kazakhstan right. in the fall, but with right. with the pandemic, I'm not sure what our schedule is going to be now. I'm, I'm thinking a like a small little 22 inch carbon fiber slider. So, uh, so I did take that. I have and I have uh, again the the Rhino Gear guys have been fantastic. Kyle, um, when I first got the the Evo slider or whatever, I wanted one that was 20 inches or 21 inches right, because so fit, yeah. it fit. And I called them and they cut one for me. And he said it was a pain in the ass. Evidently cutting that carbon fiber <laughs> was a pain in the ass. Uh, but they made me a, a version of it. Um, I tell you really what, I, what I'd love to do. And that's, again, what I, you know, I'm excited about the Komodo is the Komodo and the, and the Ronin S uh, is just, mm -hmm. I think, a fantastic combination. It's, it's um, light enough for you to hand hold. Yeah. For... You know, and coming out, you know, that's the problem. I would love to take a slider here, but. Remember, I got to carry it 22 oh, miles yeah. one way. I'm just thinking slide shot across those two by fours up top yeah. would, would look amazing with four yeah. around and back. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think that, that that handheld gimbal really sort of enables you to do those kind of things. And, and I could do that sort of semi slider move and then, you know, within DaVinci Resolve, block it off a little bit more. Right. And I have to take all the tools. I'd love to take a full you know, gear kit with me here. I, I, we've tried, we've contact, you know, we've built out, uh, contacts. Um, you know, my, I did a show at the UN, as I mentioned for the 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl accident, I was invited by the UN to do a, a solo exhibition. Um, and Helen Clark, who was the former prime minister of New Zealand opened it for me, opened the show along with, um, um uh, foreign minister Mackay from Belarus. Uh, so I became, friends with them and you know so through those people hopefully these contacts we can sort of develop and actually tell these stories because i'm not going into this with the especially if the, this comes out you know if we ever get to shoot this that yes it was definitely copied from the u.s if they didn't and and there's you know it's 50 50 right now, i want to tell that story i want the history right. to be documented as as at least the information be out there as accurate as possible then people can dissect that information for whatever they want so I see you've got a light on here. Did did you need it? Was yeah. I mean, so have it on. Yeah. So I have it on. It it did help inside the inside the cockpit. Obviously, oh, I needed sure. it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's blind spot gear. Billy at blind spot was fantastic. This is their little uh, flat light. So again, I'm a, a geek. I think I've got every little LED light imaginable that you could buy. Um, so I, I guess I didn't mention my my degrees. I have a two engineering degrees from the University of Colorado. One is in civil engineering, one's in architectural engineering. And the architectural engineering is especially in illumination. So actually, I started my career my first year and a half out of college as an illumination engineer. So I did lighting design for Gap, Banana Republic, uh, the, the Kennedy Center in, in, in uh, DC, hot motel, or hotels and malls and everything else. So I love lighting. I've always been looking for that super bright, compact light. And, gotcha. and and the blind spot gear light is really this interesting technology where they've sort of embedded the LED or they've embedded the, the panel so it's, it glows from a, the, the phosphorus um, 
uh, the UV light that comes out from the LED. So oh, it was a yeah. great. So it's, it's like a Cineo. Exactly. Cineo, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a great little light. And then I've got a ton of uh, small gear or small rig parts on top of that uh, yeah. thing because they just make that. great stuff. Don't ever make the mistake of looking oh, at the UV and, lights. Yep, and so my the strap on there is uh, Ivan Eric Ar Arrington. Ar I hope I'm pronouncing it. Ivan, Ivan. Yeah, oh, yeah. Agerton. Agerton. That's that. The reason I have that strap on there is because of him. So he said you get an AR strap, and it gives you the ability to have three points when you're holding oh, your like camera. Holding yeah. yeah. And so I did that. And then the funny thing is, I'm I'm a tiny guy, so the strap was still a little long. So my wife's an interior designer, and one of her um, uh, workshops short the strap for me. <laughs> and Tim Tim said Jared said he tried the Weeble S with Komodo. The question is, and and <laughs> exactly, exactly. Do you tell? Yep. So this is the, going to the smaller little uh, uh, headlight on top. Yep. So this is some um, um, sitting on top of the crow's nest. Uh, this is where we would stand watch. Uh, and so the funny thing is, so as I'm. Earlier, this is where I was up and I saw um, the guards come. They were in our building. You know, I'm sort of down low so they won't see me. And then I finally see them go into the building in the background, which is where the Energia is. And they drive around to the side. And they had climbed through a window. And I turned to Eric, my friend. I'm like, why did they climb through a window? And Eric had to remind me, no one has keys to these buildings. They're 30 <laughs> years old. I said, ah, that does make sense. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so from a headlamp perspective, again, um, uh, Nightcore makes amazing LED lights. That's what I have on there. Yeah. The Nightcore light is a thousand lumens. Um, it uses AAA, right, or AA? No, it uses that the, the, the uh, eighteen six fifty or whatever. Oh, okay. yeah. That's and it's the big and, yep, and it's rechargeable, uh, USB rechargeable in that unit. And then I've switched to I use that one, and then I got a new one by Ace Beam. Makes another. First of all, Ace Beam. We'll see their light later on, but Ace Beam makes a headlight that's actually. Um, I think it's almost 4,000 lumens on turbo, Wow! you know, and runs like constantly at 8,000 lumens. So again, this is all starting to work together now, because if you, you stick with all that kind of flashlight and headgear and you go to like a, a Zion crane or yep. uh, anything like that, they all use 18650s. Now you're taking your, your battery to the same type of battery. Yep. And the ACE beam actually uses the next one up to 25 something 22, or other. 22, 22, yeah. 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 So, so this is, so here's, here's the gear that I took with me to, uh, to Baikonur. So I have my two lenses. I have a 2470 and my, um, 1635, uh, all packed in. This is the, I think that's the, the large, um, internal camera unit. And you can see how I outfitted it with the, the Trek pack stuff that right. Georgia helped me with. Um, and it's like, it, it's Changa getting everything in there. So you can see the red, I have it mounted, I have it, the, I cut it out so the handle can stay on. I got my, my, um, uh, 5D in the in the upper left hand corner there. I use for camera ties straps. I use I, I was a climber in college, and so I use a lot of climbing gear. So those are little climbing uh, uh, nuts that I just w w wrap in there with the wire because I know they're not going to come apart. Right. Um, and then there's just a, a ton of batteries <laughs> laying around in there. And that's the one thing right there that I like about the four seven and the five inch monitors on red. Exactly. Is flat. Exactly. I do it on my seven, but everybody cringes. I always, yep. I always put like a, a a foam pad in between it, just for protection. But uh, yep, yep. That that is that. that that's that's the the one thing I love about that. First of all, it's a robust monitor. I mean, I think it's bulletproof, it and I can leave it on there and close that bag and and be good to go. Yeah. Yep. So that, that's, MREs. Yep. So that that's my sleeping area. So there's my my. Uh, in this trip, it was a thirty. Yeah, this one was a, the the thirty degree bag. I took the forty degree bag later, which was a mistake because uh, I wanted to lighten the load. But you can see my blue shade battery there. You can see the f stop gear bag and my MREs. Um, I've gotten to the point, you know, during this pandemic, I've been bored and researching. Um, I'm gonna make my own MREs. I figured out how to do it <laughs> with retort bags and a Instapot cooker. Um, I'm gonna and a, and a vacuum sealer. I'm gonna start making my own MREs. That's, it's funny because I, I took my MREs, which are you know U.S. based. My friends were there with their their equivalent, which are the European based. They have like sardines and metal canned stuff I would yeah. never eat. You know, I I yeah. have never tried to make an MRE, and I 
didn't think it would be that possible, but maybe it is. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. We need to have Philip Grossman's cooking channel. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's the engineer in me. I'm like, oh, I need to figure out how to do it. Yep. So this is inside of the uh, Energia building. So this thing, like I said, is 30 stories tall, 325 feet, I think. Um, and of course, you got to hike up there. And so this is the Energia. And this building was actually designed as a shaker table. So this is basically the world's largest vibration table to test this. And you can see it in Russian, it says Energia uh, M. And that's the model because they make one with two rockets. And then the one that actually launches the shuttle has four rockets on it. Wow. Yeah, we hiked across there. It was at night or it was five o'clock in the morning before the sun came up. We ran across each took turns. The first person, we had one person to keep lookout. Everybody ran across. And then the last person came and we were back in there keeping lookout to make sure no one was there. And it's it's a long, it's you know, it's a kilometer, you know. So it's just sitting up oh, at the yeah, top. They left the rocket intact. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's been sitting there for thirty years. Obligatory so. red photo. Yep. 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 Yeah. And my iPhone or my hydrogen with me, so I could take photos of my gear, my oh, gear form. So you can just see just how big it is, and it doesn't sit at the very bottom. It's actually up on a stand because it's a shaker table. I mean, it looks like. Um, there's a kid's TV show when I was a little kid called Johnny Sacco. It was the same time around Ultraman. And I just saw this and it just reminded me of Johnny Sacco. <laughs> and it's all liquid rockets, liquid fuel. It's not, not solid fuel like the U.S. rockets. And, and again, these, yeah. So the, the, the U.S. Was, was solid rocket boosters. Then they had liquid propellant on the space shuttle. They did none yeah, of that. Yeah. And they were all liquid, and it, this yep. had to have all the power to, to yep. lift everything. Yep, and the 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 shuttle itself, or the the Baron vehicle, had sort of jet engines on it. Had no real rocket engines. It was mainly for if there was an issue um, when they when you launched, if it had to, and they also had an ejection system on it. But it was an issue if it launched and they had to eject the rock the shuttle from the Baron. They could fly it like an airplane, and then when it came back in, it had a little bit maneuver, a little more maneuvering, but it had no rocket engine. Right. There's just another shot of me inside filming. So, you know, I've, I've I've also experimented with various pants, boots, jackets, trying to figure out hats, gloves, lightweight stuff, tripods. Um, I've been kind of big fan of of Eddie Bauer's uh, first ascent series of stuff. It's it's very very lightweight. Um, the jackets are very warm. Um, yeah, the, the, the stitching is not as robust. It, it fails here and there, but you know, for the price it's, you know, a couple years away and then you throw them out, unfortunately. So um, what was the wildlife like inside these buildings? Were there like animals running around that scare the crap out of you or what? No, the only place we really ran into animals, obviously Chernobyl, there's animals and then in Fukushima, but here it's in the middle of a desert. You're really in the middle of a high step desert. There's literally no, there's camels. We saw camels when we were hiking. <laughs> um, but in the buildings, I don't even think I remember even seeing birds inside the buildings. Really? Well, yeah. there's bird poo. You can see yeah, that. Yeah, there's some, but we really didn't see much of was in there. So, hey, look at that full control. Yep. So this is, so now, you know, after shooting those rockets, I'm like, well, maybe I should shoot some U.S. rockets. Um, so through my, my work with my day job, um, uh, I, I met people at, at NASA and at the, the, uh, the, the, the um, Space Command wing, and they were running into issues with how do they capture at night launches. This is actually where's a test for their, their rocket safety system. So they need to be able to see the rocket at launch for the first three to five seconds. And if it veers more than, I think it was three or four degrees in any direction, they would destroy the rocket so that it doesn't run into anything. Right. And so their issue was that at night, the rocket engine would launch, would ignite, and they couldn't see anything. So I was down doing a presentation on cinematography, and, and they asked me if I could help them with this. And so I said, you need a, a camera that has – first I said, what are you guys shooting on? It was <laughs> Literally, they're pulling out VHS tapes and showing me the footage. It's an SD analog system, <laughs> you know, maybe six stops in dynamic range. I said, you know what? The, the camera that has the greatest dynamic range right now that I'm aware of is the red. I have one. Let me come down and do some testing for you. So I got to go down and, uh, and test out um, the red. And I tell you, I've, the dynamic range from pitch black to the sun, no camera can handle that. <laughs> um, but it did come pretty close. They were actually very impressed with their ability to still be able to see because they don't put a lot of light on the rocket before it launches anyhow. 
Um, and it depends on who's launching it, whether it's it's uh, Blue Origin or in this case, it was all SpaceX launches. Um, but we did about three tests, and this was the first test. And you know, and a, a friend uh, 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 Matt Carmen, who works for for uh, Canon, helped me out. And let, let me the four hundred millimeter. That was my big issue. We were about a mile and a half uh, at one of their television sites. Um, and I was like, oh, am I going to be close enough? And of course, with the red, the nice thing is I could crop down and do the zoom. But I was I was at seven k there and was with a four hundred millimeter. Would HDRX flag. help? I mean, you should be able to drop the stops way down. Yes, except that they need to see it live. So oh, we're actually so outputting. Yeah, yeah, so we're actually <laughs> outputting SDI on that uh, for them to be able. To, I recorded an HDRX just to see what the range could be, and that's the other th interesting thing about the. Uh, the red and, and having that R3D format is that I was able to actually show them what the various stop levels were because I could go in and adjust the ISO and show them it. You know, granted, there are some things that were completely blown out, but I could say this is what those things are at at one stop below, two stops below, three gotcha. stops below. Yeah. I was able to figure out and dial in what my footage had to be, so what my camera had to be set at. And of course, with with Mica, I had it. You know, the full control is fantastic, um, and was able to set everything up. And I actually have. I think this was the helium and the Gemini, and then I did a Monstro and Gemini or Monstro and helium test as well. I I, I love rockets. I, I yeah. incidentally, like two hours before the live stream, I sent Elon Musk a tweet saying, "Hey, I'd really love to come shoot rockets." So if anybody wants yeah. to help out, you retweet that, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out: can I make it down there the 28th of May or 22nd yeah, of May? Yeah, no. Now they got the app. Have you have you got the app? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm trying to get down there to shoot it. I'm like. Uh, I don't know, so I'll have to figure that out. So There's you can see the Sigma this, 150 to 600. Yep, yep. And that was on, the, I think that was on the Gemini, and then I had the, uh, the the helium, and then the next launch was, uh, I did the Monstro and the helium uh, just to do a couple different tests for them. Um, so it's fun. And, and again, 35 megapixels still, you know, yeah. out of that camera. And you can just see the dynamic range of the camera. You got basically the sun coming out of the bottom of the rocket, and then you have, you know, the light around it. So were you okay. shooting at one one forty eighth of a second? Um, no, because I was shooting at twenty at twenty nine nine seven for them. So is it okay. at, at at sixty? Okay. And oh, then well, I, you're shooting that one at sixty. Yeah. And then and then the, one of them I did HDRX, so I had to pump that up even more. Oh, and okay. I was actually able to actually the, increase the uh, f stop a little bit too. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Yep. Yep. So, and, and through all this, I got to meet some astronauts. So that's uh, Scott Perzinski, who was a shuttle astronaut. He's a physician. You know, I'm, <laughs> people go, man, you've done a lot of stuff in your life. <laughs> and then I met this guy, Stanford doctor, shuttle pilot, invents this, climbed Everest twice. I mean, he made me feel like I've done nothing in my life, like I'm a slacker. But he was such a nice guy. And I got to tour around uh, uh, NASA when I was down there with just him and uh, he showed me around. And we're actually out at the beach house. Couldn't get me into the beach house. But for those space junkies, the beach house is where all the astronauts and their families go the night before the launch. And they get a bottle of champagne or whatever, and they sign it and put it in there. That's a giant liquor cabinet right now. <laughs> so this is, this is actually the gear loadout prior to uh, the second trip to Kazakhstan. And I can tell this because you see the knee brace there just at the lower center part. Because I, the first trip I had at night, I had stepped wrong. And I have a, oh. a not a really bad knee, but I... It was like, oh, my God. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this just in case. Um, but this is all the gear that I did for my loadout for my second trip to uh, Kazakhstan. And the next photo, you'll see how I got all this stuff fit into two bags. So that's the medium north face bag. And then that's the larger Suka bag. So uh, F-stop yeah, F -stop gear makes uh, on their – they have, I think, four or five bags in the range. And I have the Suka – and the, I forgot the other one. They're basically the same height uh, and depth. The difference is the Suka, which I think is, if I got that right, the larger bag, is, is wider. It's two inches wider. Now, it's two inches wider than what's legal for the airplane. Right. But, but, you what, you, up and you, but what, what I actually do is I flip the IC, internal IC, the internal camera unit, in the normal location, drop it down because it's only the 12 inches or 13 inches, whatever the max is. And then when I'm on site for the hike, <coughs> excuse me, I can rotate it and drop it lower in the bag, which gives me more room for food and the drone and everything else gotcha. at the top. Yeah. Well, I've, I mean, that was the thing about 
those bags as well as I, I need them to be carry on legal. Yep. I mean, I, I use my uh, mountain smiths and I cinch them up real yep. tight so that they compress to just barely fit it. Right. So the second bag is carry on legal. Um, of course, I weighed it down far beyond the carry on <laughs> legal weight. Yes, it's but, light as a feather. But I don't let anybody hold it. And the only time I've ever had an issue was Aeroflot coming out of Tashkent, Uzbekistan, that they said it was too big. And of course, I told them, I fly this bag all over the place. I've dealt a million mile, or I know what this bag is going to fit. And they're like, well, they're not going to allow you, blah, blah. And eventually, you, you act like you know what you're doing. And you'd be nice right. about it. I really did. It wasn't right. like, oh, I was like, oh, yeah. I fly this all the time. You know, like, they, I don't understand. Yeah. I do this and then, all the time. Yeah. And, and then, so well, it's got to go underneath. And so well, it can't because it has batteries in it. That's right. the other thing. Now, the nice thing is, Worst case scenario, if they ever really pushed you, is you can you take, take the, the ICU, ICU out. Yeah, it'll fit. You just wind up having to pay for an extra carry on at that point in time, which is. I mean, it is really yeah. the 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 allure of the f stop bags, and it's yeah. it's. I mean, it's just such an expensive purchase. That's five hundred dollars yeah. for that bag. Well, now the, there's there's two hundred and fifty to three hundred for the bag, and then the ICUs are a hundred to hundred. Yeah, it's it's roughly three to five hundred dollars for all of this stuff, but it's a lifetime bag. Uh, you know, and I, I've had low low pro bags, and they're all great bags. This is the most universally useful bag to me because of those right. ICUs. I can get multiple different ones. I've got them all outfitted. So if I'm taking still in motion or just motion or just lenses or whatever, it's just it's a fantastic bag. And then you can carry it. So this was the so my second trip to Kazakhstan. We actually organized it where we got permission to go and actually shoot the uh, Soyuz launch. This is the MS-10 launch. So we had gotten permission to go into the city of Baikonur on this for three or four days. Um, and it's the only time I've ever had to sneak out of a city. <laughs> Usually I'm sneaking into places. I had to sneak out because we wanted to go get our pictures taken. Or I want to go get, I want to go take a picture of the thing. So this is the, the, in the morning we got to go and watch the, and film them rolling the rocket out. And this is the Soyuz rocket. They've been launching this thing from the fifties. It's basically the same thing, obviously updated some of the technology on board, but it, they've been doing this, you know, hundreds of times. So they've trained right. rolled out rockets on its side. So this is early in the morning. So you can see that's the launch pad there in the distance. Um, and we got to go right up against the tracks there as they're bringing it out and, you know, got everything going. And okay. so you can see, so now interesting thing, keep note of the color of the lower half of the rocket. It's sort of a gray green. Just remember mm -hmm. that with a picture coming up, you know, you recognize the building in the background. I do. Yeah. So that's the hangar where the shuttle is. So that's the whole, we're like, oh my God, we're yeah. two kilometers, but we can't get there. We have to actually go outside and hike you know, 20 kilometers back in. Huh. And so we got right up on the launch pad where they're, you know, the rocket came in and they're getting ready to, to raise it up into its location. Again, these are all stills from the, uh, from the Epic or from the helium. So it's 35 megapixels. So that's what I've got motion of these guys doing it. And I got a 35 megapixel still. Uh, your, your wife has a comment here. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the whole reason we're getting that the Instapot so we can make our own MREs. She's like, oh crap. I know, I know, I know. Uh, and so you can see that the rocket gets stood up, then his arms come in and lock into place. And you know, I'm right there, you know, within you know a hundred feet of them doing this, which is fantastic. You know, you can see this is sort of that that location of where I was located. And again, being able to shoot stills and motion at the same time. Do they take those flags down before they launch? <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They'll clean the whole area. But it's interesting. Their they're, they're launch, that rocket is actually suspended. So they're, really? the, the, all the, the, the exhaust actually is being filtered sort of behind where that rocket is. It's an interesting way in which they, they do their launches, which enables them to, to launch more quickly. So it's just, a, a, you know, again, a 35 megapixel still, the close-up at the top of as that uh, platform's yeah, coming in there. Yep. Detail right there. Oh. Yep. And so they actually have two launch pads. So the, the first launch pad where that rocket is is called the Gregarin step. That's actually where uh, uh, Gregarin uh, launched the, the first man in the space launch from there. And this is the secondary launch facility they have. Um, so they have proton rockets and they have Soyuz rockets, and they're sort of similar. But this, the proton rockets are the heavy lifters, and this is the launch pad which they come out to. And we were able to go, you know, go and tour that. And so this is that same. I, I showed you the, the launch site from the aerial drone. This right. is sort of that close up as we were driving by. Yep, yep, yep. 
Did I? Okay, there we go. Yep. And so this is my setup for actually filming the launch of the uh, of the rocket. Uh, so I got my full control there with me as well. And I got a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, IS on it. Uh, I think I shot 8K uh, 60 for it. Remind me when we're done. I have a blue shape question to ask you. I, okay. I think you're a person that that I know. I just want to. I don't want to do it on here because of, of what the question is. But okay. Remind no, me no worries. <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, and there. So there's... now, remember I said, remember the color of the rocket. Right. Look at the color of the rocket. It's white at the bottom. That's frost. Oh, and because of all the liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen for the longest time, I was like, what, what is, did they paint the rocket? They did it. No, that's all the frost from the liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen. Wow. You know, of course in the lower end where it's slightly fuzzy. Yeah. Yep. And at the end of the, at the bottom of the rocket there, it goes back where the engines are. And, and of course the interesting thing, this is MS 10. For those who don't remember, MS 10 is the Soyuz launch that failed with Nick Hegg on board. So as Nick's first launch, he had just become an astronaut a couple years earlier. This was his first launch to space. They got up about 20 miles. And so the way that the, the rockets you see, the four on the bottom are stage one. What happens is that there's an explosive bolt that launches on the top of those. And those rockets sort of fall away. And then the bolt on the bottom launches away. And actually makes this real interesting sort of cross in the sky. What happened is during assemblage of this rocket, they, were, they damaged one of those bolts. So what happened is the lower bolt exploded first and instead of falling away, flipped into the rocket. And that sent off sensors and effectively, so you, you'll see there's a, a um, the big pointy thing at the top of the rocket that's yes, part of the escape, escape. system. Yeah. That had already been jettisoned. Oh. And so uh, there's still more rockets in the lower half. So that secondary jettison system blew them away. So they went from 20 miles to 30 miles during that period of time. And then came back down to Earth at like uh, 600 miles an hour, 700 miles an hour, <laughs> uh, about 400 miles away from the launch site. Everybody was safe and sound, and Nick, you know, went up before. So on this particular trip, we had to leave the city when we were done because we only had permits for four days. Um, we're back in Terratem. But you can see this cow's walking across the street. Back in the same hotel room, and I'm just, you know, we spent two days there sort of prepping for this trip in order to, to be able to leave. And then uh, there I am. There's the hydrogen. Using the hydrogen to do some time lapse uh, in that same lookout area. So they give you sort of a sense of scale of, of the thing. And you can see that ladder that's on the side there. We right. found that in the in the facility, just a, you know, bar carried uh, Yep, carried it over. And it's still quite a distance from the door. So it was, it was quite a, a feat to get up inside there. Um, and that door, there's actually two doors. So there's an outdoor, outside door that folds out and an inside door that folds in. And I think, and I, I joked that the design was because once you're in there, they lock you and you can't get out. <laughs> but that thing, that thing is solid. I, I sat on there and bounced up and down just to check it. It was not moving anywhere. So and this is the, the engineering rocket and that had a different thing. And again, you can see how much lower it is. So it had to sort of climb and shimmy up on top. Wow. There's the rock again. Yeah, yeah. I love the the darker images. This. Yeah, there's just so much detail in that in that still too. That's again what I love about that red camera is just the amount of detail, uh, dynamic range, the contrast. There's just so much information in there that I would never have gotten from a 4K still for sure. Right. Yeah. So there's at the very very top looking down. Wow. Yeah, you can see how tall that building is. It's not a fun yeah. climb. Yeah, no. and we had going After up and down to get out there too. Yeah, and this is one of the control rooms with inside that building or with inside the the hangar where the shuttles are located. That was a raised floor. That was. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. For our IT friends. Right. Yep. And this is on our way back out. You know, it was freezing, uh, and we made it. And this is the halfway point. Uh, we stopped and got our water and relaxed here a while, but it was it was cold on that hike back you gotta choose your battles you're gonna be in the desert do you want it to be cold or hot i know i know i know so then on this particular trip the second trip uh Arik and i decided to go to semi semi palatinsk so semi palatinsk is where the russians detonated their first nuclear bomb it's actually the equivalent of i guess los alamos labs or or the nevada proving grounds really 
It's where they, they detonated 453 nuclear bombs uh, starting in the mid 50s. So this is us catching a train from, and of course, you know, every country, the train gauges are a little bit different. The Russian right. gauges, or the you know, Russian in general, and this is, uh, it happens to be Kazakhstan, are really, really wide. And this was a, you know, probably, looks like the train was built in the 50s. Interesting. Because American is four foot ten and a half. Yep, yep. And then this is uh, inside. inside so, that's, yep. so this was a 17-hour train ride. So that was my bunk for 17 hours. And it, you can't really tell, but there's a, a nice Kazakhstan lady below me with her husband. I, you know, if we would have, we didn't think about it, but what we should have done is just rented the entire cabin. I think it was ten dollars for the train ticket. Right. You know, for twenty bucks we each, we could have had the entire cabin. These people, they had a crock pot. They're making stuff in there. It stunk, um, but you know, that's that's part of the the, the joy and the experience. The charm. Yep, <laughs> seventeen hours across the Kazakhstan desert. So this is where we where we finished way out in semi palatinsk and so they, they decided to go out there because they, they, theoretically there were no people living out there the reality is there were no bads living out there mm -hmm. um and this is where they did all their nuclear t bomb testing so this There's is french this, fries yep so this was a typical meal in in semi palatinsk the local restaurant i'm not sure what the meat i'm not sure if that was beef or chicken i think it was chicken it looks chickeny yep but they always had fries so we had fries and that was considered a gourmet meal were they yeah. freedom fries or were they just really <laughs> They, I, you know, I think they were, uh, you know, they were Russian Soviet fries, Orida skis. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, and so this is out. This is actually where they did their first test. So these are they call these the um, goosenecks. So these were structures that uh, house uh, uh, gauges and things for, for sampling the area. And they, they were set, I think, it's every 50 meters or every 100 meters out you know, several kilometers from ground zero. And the funny thing is, I know exactly when this picture was taken, October 19th. I didn't, that's my birthday. I didn't realize that I was standing at the site of ground zero on the day of my, I knew my birthday was coming up, but you lose track of days when you're doing this stuff. And I looked at my watch or my phone. I'm like, oh my God, it's my birthday today. So I celebrated my 49th birthday in, in Kazakhstan. So this is where actually the filming equipment was located. So I actually have a, they have a camera that does a hundred thousand frames a second. And it was located in this building to be able to capture the initial blasts. And you, we've all seen the American version of this where you have the houses and the cars, all the models. Right, right. They, all, they did the exact same thing. They had a railroad bridge, they had a car bridge, they had houses. You know, we, we toured their sort of museum in their, in their, um, uh, uh, educational facility that's there and they showed us all those kind of things so but the, the landscape is just you know just amazing the weather was great too so you can see that the radiation level so again typical background radiation sitting where i am now is about 0.2 microsieverts on an airplane flying across the country gets up to maybe three microsieverts here it's 15 microsieverts hmm. at ground zero not a very clean place yep yep so that's me standing outside yeah it's one of those things I didn't think two years ago that all those N95 masks that I bought would come in handy. Man, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. So you like the 24 to 105? Yeah. So that was my sort of, okay, let's, let's, what lens if I'm going to go in there? Cause I really don't want to be changing lenses, especially in right. this kind of it's area. It's versatile. Yep. And it had the IS on it. So it helped it's me. It's not I, fast. No, but I was shooting outside on this one. Um, so that's why I, I opted for that one. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm shooting outside. It's got IS on it. So yeah. I guess the stabilization because it's doing more handheld work here because you can't really put tripods down. I like that lens better than the 24 to 70 too. It's, oh, really? Uh, yeah. Because the 24 to 70 is just not as clear. It's, yeah. it's kind of meh. It's old. It, it is. <laughs> they have an updated the lens. I'm waiting for them to come out with a new one. So this, this lake was actually created by a nuclear explosion. They oh, were the testing, world. and the U.S. did it as well, though the Russians did it far more than the U.S. did. They wanted to see if they could excavate using nuclear bombs. Well, I mean, it's fast. I mean, it just yep. happens. Yep. And there are people we, we met that were fishing in that lake, the local oh. nomads. Now, the, grand, the, the water itself is not radioactive. Way down at the bottom is very radioactive. How big were those fish? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three eyes, you know, it was a bonus. Yeah. Oh, so, that's a nomad. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I always say this is my homage to Ivan. So Ivan does great Western photos. Yes, he does. Yep. And so this is my homage to, to Ivan. This was a, a, a local that was there with his cows. Um, and this is where those little uh, uh, um, liquor bottles came in handy. We traded him liquor bottles to let us take his photograph. Now, did you get an Ivan right up in his face shot? 
No, I didn't get that close with him. He was he was stayed on the horse. But because so he's got a cigarette though. So yeah, but it's a thirty five megapixel still, so I could probably pop you know zoom in there pretty quick and and, and still have a pretty decent image. Uh, but again, the colors are great, and the nomads are just they farm. They have cows on there. Um, hmm. The radiation levels have somewhat dropped, um, but it's still uh, I would not be living there doing that. So this is an underground bunker that was there. This is where they would manage the test from um, when they were doing the radio. And, and they did so many above ground tests, 100 and some above ground tests, and then there was a ban on above ground testing, so they started doing below ground testing. Did you happen to see the villagers with the three arms? Yeah. Uh, no, did not see villagers with three arms. We did go to semi, uh, uh, in Semipalatinsk, uh, semi, the, the city nearby this area. Um, where they, we got to go to the medical school there and they actually have things in jars with you know, mm. abnormalities. So this is sort of what's left on the inside of that facility. So now we're switching more, to- yeah, <laughs> More not. <laughs> yeah, actually this is nuclear. So this is Fukushima. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so Fukushima actually has, there are two, re so when people say Fukushima, there's Diani and Diachi. There's actually two sets of reactors. There's six reactors in each complex. Diachi is the one that actually had the incident, and this is Diachi, and it's it's hard to tell in this one, but it sort of center right, you can sort of see some of the superstructure that's disappeared. That was actually one of the reactors. So when a reactor was melt, so they had meltdowns. So the first thing is a meltdown isn't necessarily a catastrophic event for the world. It's a catastrophic event for the reactor because it pretty much destroys the reactor. You can't use it, right? Um, or you have to basically remove everything and then rebuild it and they typically don't in this case when when you're having a um uh when, when things get to that point you're having that meltdown that runaway you wind up uh doing electrolysis both because of the nuclear power the heat that's happening um and the zir zircaloy which is the housing that goes around the nuclear fuel you have this electrolysis so you have hydrogen and oxygen forming and they have to vent it so they vented it inside this metal superstructure outside of the reactor, and that's actually what blew up. People are like, well, the reactor blew up. No, the reactor didn't blow up. The superstructure blew up, and that's this, this image here. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing about nuclear power plants. Like, the reason Chernobyl did what it did is because they did not have the fail-safes in the, mm -hmm. the secondary systems. Mm -hmm. Japan had it, but there were there were design flaws. So, so it wasn't, wasn't a design flaw. So what happened in, in Fukushima, and it, so they designed the reactor for an 8.5 or an 8.6 Richter uh, earthquake. Right. They had a nine. The likelihood of having a nine was like a one in a billion chance or something ridiculous like that. The issue they had is they built the seawall that was, right. you know, 60 feet high. Well, no one thought that a wave would be higher than 60 feet. The other issue they had is their generators were below the seawall. Right. They had not been raised. And so they lost power and then their generators lost power. And so they had nothing to run their pumps. Diani well, had, the re had their generators above the seawall. And so they that, didn't have the issue. And that stuff was called out, I thought, ahead of time. And they just didn't do it because so, of budget reasons. Yeah, budgeting and, and time. And it's, you know, it's, hindsight's always 2020. Sure. There you can see in the, on the right, lower right-hand corner the superstructure that, that was destroyed. Um, and the, the, the thing that we were very lucky or fortunate about during the accident is that three of the reactors at, at Diachi were offline for, um, for maintenance. So they didn't have, they, you know, it could potentially have been worse. The issue they have now is that they have seawater going in, it's radioactive and they've got to keep pumping it out, what they're going to try and do with the seawater. And you'll there's all kinds of towers and all, you know, places that they're trying to store it all. And the other thing that people don't realize is that it happened during an earthquake. So all the right. devastation and destruction you see, like in this photo, um, and this is uh, Futaba, I believe, um, is the result of the earthquake, not the, the result of the reactor. And so the radiation levels in this area are not really all that high. There is a specific area because they did have to vent gases with, with iodine, radioactive, iodine-137. Um, and so there is this, this area where the weather sort of took it up into a valley, and those areas are, were very radioactive. And there's actually, so there were areas of red zone, uh, orange zone and green zone. Green zone you could visit anytime. Orange zone you could visit but had to leave by five o'clock and red zone you had to have permission. They no longer have green and orange zones. They only have a few red zones left. They've actually cleaned up and the way they cleaned up they actually learned a lot from 
uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Right. And actually, one of the things I learned when I visited Belarus is that the Japanese were some of the first people to help the Belarusian government. Belarus doesn't have a lot of natural, uh, uh, they're an agri agricultural or ag agrarian society. They do a lot of farming. And so they didn't have a lot of uh, ele you know, natural elements that they could harvest. So the Japan came and helped them and did a lot of the research. When Fukushima happened, Belarus was one of the first to come to the Japanese help with all the things they had learned about farming and cleaning up after the accident. And so they're able to, uh, here they basically, they washed all the buildings down, got all the, the radioactive iodine off them, and then they took up the first three centimeters of soil and removed it from all the villages. So most of the villages have, have, uh, have gone back to normal. So this is actually me and, and Neotokon. My, my friend Arik was actually doing the documentary and I was there helping him uh, as the DP. Uh, cinematographer, and he arranged an uh, interview with Neotokan. And Neotokan was the prime minister of Japan during the accident. So we got to sit down, and, and Eric interviewed him. And afterwards, I got my picture taken with him. And that's one of the things I like about the work that I do is meeting these people and learning about it. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to meet you know heads of state and, and things like that. And you can sort of right. see our our that my my uh, typical blue shape on the back there, and uh, we. Um, Took a uh, we took a monstro and we took a, a, a my helium with me. Nice. Oh, yep. So this is me. I acting as the sound guy finally. So I was running sound <laughs> for the one man band. Uh, we had we had a couple other camera guys with us as well, uh, but I was helping out running sound and running camera. This is inside. So lean back going on. Oh, oh yeah, that thing was heavy. And then to get here, we actually had to leave at about because this is inside an off limits area, a red zone. Um, we had to we left the place where you were staying at like three o'clock in the morning, um, effectively drove by the edge of the road, slowed down the van, opened up the door, the van kept moving and we jumped out. <laughs> Our translator was driving um, and then down into this valley and through the woods and to get to the, uh, to the, get to the hospital and start filming. Wow. Yeah. And again, we worked five or six different ways to figure out where to put the monitors and to make sure they were flexible because each guy who was filming, you know, that we had two camera guys with us, each one had a different way of liking to film and you know some was a cam some was b cam and so we came up with a bunch of different ways to quickly remove and add the yeah the, yeah, yeah pretty smart yeah that's so inside the hospital so it's just a you know was it, it very very different than than chernobyl and it's funny to see in chernobyl the people don't talk about the accident because they there's still this mentality of um of the, the former KGB in the Soviet Union. Someone's listening, I can't talk bad about the right. state. In Fukushima, it's very different. It is, I'm embarrassed that it happened. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just different the, society. The floor is all over the place. Is that from the earthquake? Or is uh, yeah, a little bit from the earthquake. There, there are some uh, corner of that building, I think, had collapsed because of the earthquake. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. So this is a, you know, one of the grocery stores. And, and so this is actually... So I put this in there. This was actually taken three years prior to that trip. This store now has been completely clean and is actually opened again. Really? Yep. Yep. Wow. Or four years, I guess, later. So you can see they left and oh, it smelled. <laughs> in some <of> <laughs> now, some of it already aged off. You know, it had been several years, obviously, beforehand. But in some of the areas, it was smelly. So you see the, the spiders have taken over. <laughs> so there were spiders everywhere in those buildings. And then one of those buildings is funny because we're walking around, you know, we're, we're, they, there wasn't as much police presence there, although it's, you know, ran into police quite often. And a very different, they were always afraid that we were journalists and we were going to say something bad about the police. So they didn't really want to question us, but they had to question us type thing. Um, and so in this building, there's actually a Kentucky fried chicken as well. And I walked around the corner and there's a Colonel Sanders sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, statue <laughs> scared the crap out of me. You know, another <laughs> person standing there. So this is a, a you know again another drone shot parking lot that's just sort of grown over. We got stopped by the police there, and the funny thing is the city the power is still on. So this is at night, all the traffic lights are on, the street lights are on. Who Nobody's changes home. The bulbs, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's planetarium. that's planetarium. Yep. So that it, and it's hard to tell, but the floor is covered with sand. This was right near the ocean in Futaba, I believe. And so the waters had come in the the, the swell um, and filled the lower half of that with, with that. And wow. this is actually this is actually a, a, a Canon 5D image. There's no light inside that room. 
that's an extremely long exposure. I think it was like, you know, half a minute to a minute exposure. Wow. And, you know, Bicycle. Bicycles, yep, just laying there. So and this is one of the, the city buildings, so all the books and everything is left behind in the city building. Was the clock live or was it dead? It was dead, yeah. So that's kind of cool, though. I mean, just yeah. everything stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Calendar stopped, yeah. Yeah, that was a, a local school. Yeah, I think that was. People always say, "What what's the most thing? The thing that's most impactful when you do these visits?" I say, thinking going to the schools is because think about the children's lives that were disrupted. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have kids. I have dogs. Um, I have nieces and nephews, and I think that's probably the, the thing that emotionally hits me the most is that the kids and the impacts on their lives. You know, yeah. it wasn't a war. Even in Chernobyl, it wasn't a war, but it was so disruptive. And you know, I lived right. through it. You know, I was in third grade with 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 the. Uh, um, three mile island and just trying to put myself in, you know, what were they thinking? So now this is the most recent trip back. So in, in uh, August of this past year, I went, this is where Jacob joined us. And so I, you know, the guys on the forum, I said, I got an extra room who wants to go. And Jacob was the first to, to pony up the dollars, you know, to cover his costs. And so we went, uh, and this was the, the, uh, a full red, I finally felt comfortable hitting my focus. And so there's a lot of footage here shot uh, all around. I didn't even take the 5D with me. And so you can see that light, that's my ACE beam light. That's a, a 32,000 lumen flashlight. Really? Uh, now it'll only run at 32,000 lumens for about a minute before it overheats and it'll right. drop itself down to like 4,000 lumens. But it, it came in real handy in, uh, in, uh, inside the reactor complex. Yeah, and just put on a maggot arm so you can see there i'm filming in there i'm actually on the the rhino gear slider, slider yeah yep yep interesting yeah and that's the movie theater uh um inside that and Pripyat was one of the few you know not every city didn't have a movie theater and it had a a, a movie theater prometheus it used to have a giant um prometheus statue there as well it's been removed and it's actually over by the uh over by the um uh, headquarters the the uh of the uh, reactor complex. The question of did the residual radiation cause any issues with equipment or footage? No, nope, I've never had any issues, even in the the real radioactive areas I've gotten to with the equipment. Again, most things that falls off the square of the distance. Um, I do again. I have a dosimeter. There's a, a, a Marion Technologies is located here in Atlanta. They're the number one manufacturer of radiation detection and measuring equipment in the world. Um, I they gave me a, a dosimeter, which was great. Um, and it, uh, I keep track of everything that, that goes on. They actually gave me a, a, a Geiger counter as well recently, because I needed one that actually went above two millisieverts. Huh. Um, and I keep track of it. And, and in most trips, I get more radiation. It's only two trips where I, I haven't gotten more radiation actually on the flight there and back, uh, because they're transatlantic flights. This trip is one of them because, uh, Jacob can attest that there's a, we found a small piece of the reactor core. I remember that. Yep, yep. That was very radioactive. J um, Jacob talking about your light. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's extremely yeah. bright. Yep, yep. Here. Did yep. you put that photo of that reactor piece in here? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. I didn't. I forgot about it. So, That's so cool. this this is the Joker. So those who have who watched the uh, Chernobyl uh, uh, miniseries. Uh, there was this rush or excuse me German robot that they bought from Germany of course they didn't tell the Germans how radioactive the roof was and they, they told it was one tenth of the actual level and they put it up on the roof uh, thinking it would help them and they had to push all the radioactive material off of reactor three back into reactor four uh, so they could seal it uh, so the Joker is a real object and it's sitting here and it's the radio vehicle radioactive graveyard called Berakivka um, and it's been sitting there. You can see the silver object in front of it is actually the Russian lunar lander, which was the other um, uh, uh, vehicle that they tried to use on the roof. And of course, to get into this location, and again, uh, Jacob can, can verify this, this is off limits. And so as more tours have started to happen, it, it's been even more difficult. I visited this in 2011 and again in 12 and haven't been back since because every time we try to get permits, they wouldn't allow us even with our connections. This time we, and, and now they require your uh, military minder to wear a GPS uh, tracker. And so as we drove out, ours put it on a tree. So it looked like we were stationary. <laughs> we didn't really tell them where we were going and we went and we hiked, we'd hike through the woods and then we actually put a drone up 
in the sky and we took turns going in there to film while one person manned the drone to keep track because there's a security area on the, you know, the far end of this area. Wow. So, so this is inside the control room of reactor number three. And so everybody talks about the AZ-5 button. That's the AZ-5 button, the upper left-hand corner, the silver button. Um, oh, wow. They all have wax seals with a piece of string. So there's actually, so AZ-5 is a complete shutdown. There's actually AZ-3 and AZ-0, I think, and then something else, which would take the reactor to a certain power level. Five took it to zero level. And so each one of those has a wax seal, so you know that if it's been flipped. The AZ-5 button here, the wax seal is broken because that's how they shut the reactor down in 2000, when they finally shut the reactor down for the last time. And as I said, this was the oh, reactor amazing. ran until 2000. December 15th, 2000. These are the original shutdown uh, requirements and the documents are still sitting there. And so there's there's the, the group that went. So Jacob's in that photo with me. Uh, this is the first time that we figured out how we could potentially take um, monopods or tripods with us. We actually had to put plastic bags on the bottoms and then take the, they'll take those off. Again, it's dust control. And so the power is on in here. That's yep, yep, yep. Yep. So this is again in control room five, or excuse me, control room four, where we're at. So it's another shot within there. And again, I it's I've been there eight or nine times now. And that's the team, you know, filming inside. And each time, if people go, you know, why do you go so many times? Each time I take, you know, shots behind the the facility. I because you can only spend about five minutes inside there. Um, and so it's you know I could spend hours in there trying to investigate and put things together of what the different equipment is. Um, this time I took measurements behind the, the equipment. You know, they tried to decontaminate, but there are still areas that are 60, 70, 80 millisieverts or microsieverts. I like the, uh, you look like you're dressed up like the Oompa Loompas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. And so this is inside the uh, reactor number three again. So each of those little squares that you see, they weigh about uh, close to 800 pounds, 783 pounds. That is the, the upper biological shield of the reactor. And so each one of those is either sitting on top of a fuel channel or a control rod or an absorbing rod. And the, you can't really tell the colors, but each color represents it. Anything that's pure silver is a fuel channel. And they're, they're, they're a different um, model for their reactors in that you know, our reactors, all the fuels in one area and the water boils and creates steam. Here, each one has a separate individual uh, fuel channel. Uh, that helps. And so the, the water and steam is generated in that individual channel. Um, and it, it's also graphite moderated, which is one of the issues they had. So the, the story about what ha what actually caused the accident was that, so the, the graphite moderate, so a way a reactor works is I've got to be able to slow to, slow the neutrons down. When I split the atom, neutrons go everywhere. And the easiest way to explain this is if you take a bunch of rubber balls, if I were to take all those rubber balls and throw them on the floor, they're going to scatter, and none of them are going to run into each other. That's a prompt neutron or fast neutron. If I take those same rubber balls and I drop them slowly, the likelihood of them running into one another is much greater. And so what you do is you use a moderator. In the U.S., we use water as the moderator. In this particular reactor, they use graphite as the moderator. And so they had these control rods that had graphite in the tip. And the idea was that those rods would go through the reactor and come out the bottom and create a shield. So I have graphite on the bottom, graphite on the top. What <laughs> happened? My, uh, battery die on me. <laughs> that's, that's okay. So what happened here is that the, the reactor started to overheat a you know, long story about how it happened, but the reactor overheated. Those channels had sort of bent. And so when they finally went to hit the emergency button to try and shut down the reactor, that graphite only went in, instead of traveling the whole way through the reactor, stopped. So that control rod never got in, but the graphite did, and the graphite sped up the reaction because, again, it was slowing down those neutrons, making it easier for them to run in each other, and everything exploded. Wow. So that's, that's yep. So that's the outside of the new safe confinement center, uh, or what we call a sarcophagus two, the largest freestanding arch in the world. Um, it was actually built a kilometer away from the reactor assembled and then pushed over a 24-hour period over top of it. So I've been on the construction site two or three times throughout that process. It's just amazing how big that thing is. So when somebody asked, have you been inside? Well, yes, we were some of the first people allowed to go inside outside of the workers. Uh, now there are, I still don't think it's an official part of the tour, but they've let a few more people go in. 
Um, so that's the closest I've ever been to the old sarcophagus. Um, there are two, there's a 40 ton and an 80 ton crane in the ceiling and they're gonna begin disassembling that structure. Inside's about 20 tons of radioactive material, including uh, plutonium. Uh, and so they will slowly break that apart. The, the complex has a clean room on the other side, so they'll move the components out, move it in the clean room, disassemble them, break them into smaller pieces, um, basically encase them in a, in a dry cask storage system and then take them out. They have a dry cask storage system for fuel, and then they have a, another area that they're building to, to deep six everything. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 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 So the next photo is uh, the team inside. So again, you can see Jacob inside. So we're all inside that building. You just see how big it is uh, based on where we're at. And it's all driven by Windows 95. Actually, no, I think it's Windows 2000. It actually is Windows on all the screens that are controlling the computer stuff. So this is a, sort of an iconic area within the uh, city of Pripyat. This is middle school number three. Um, and this is where, uh, actually Pink Floyd did a video here, um, about 15 years ago, 15, no, 10, 10 years ago, they filmed eight years ago. They filmed in this area, uh, maybe, maybe it's 2014. Um, so the, there are gas masks everywhere. Everybody thinks, oh, it's because of the reactor. It's actually because they were afraid that there was a, an attack on the, by the United States. And so everybody had, it's part of their civil defense. And so these gas masks have been strewn throughout this entire uh, floor of this particular school. And uh, when you let a, a band like Pink Floyd cinematographer go in there, they really, they had them hanging on things. I, I've seen this room change over time over the last 10 years. So I tend not to want to change what I say. I will document it, but I won't go in there and move things around. I just don't think that's right. the right thing to do. I don't fault anybody else for doing it. I just don't think personally that it should be done. When uh, when we get done with all these, Jacob sent mm -hmm. that one photo of the uh, particle. Oh, okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Let's see here. So there's the the fireman's clothing again, oh, laying in the bottom. Yep. And so this that footage is actually what was licensed. I licensed a bunch of footage to uh, Craig Mason for their their the uh, last episode. The epilogue at the very end showed what Pripyat looked like today, and they used uh, footage some of my footage from the basement. So you can sort of see that's the bottom of a boot. And that's uh, it's. So I actually learned in the SI units of sieverts and microsieverts, the US, we still use REMS and millirems. So the dosimeter that was given to me by uh, Myriad Technologies is in REM. So I have to convert back and forth, but it's actually pretty easy. Just multiply by 10. So that's 1,240 microsieverts on the bottom of that boot. Ooh. So that same year, so that was in August of this past year, and in October of that year, of this past year, we decided we were going to go to um, Kursk, Russia, to try and sneak into reactor number five in Kursk. So Kursk is the sister city to Pripyat and Chernobyl. The reactor is the exact same design complex. They were built within a year of one another. They began and went through the entire process. And funny enough, they had a reactor five and six that were being built. And five was never completed and six was never done either. And so this is actually a, a drone shot that we took. And, and this is actually in Russia. So we have to be a little bit more careful. Right. Um, but this is this was what they look like. And so this is reactor number five in Kursk. Uh, again, never finished. It was actually going to be a modified version of the RBMK that was going to be a bit safer. Um, it was just too expensive. They just never finished it. That's, yeah. And, yep. And so this is, so when we got there, we, 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 you know, did our due diligence and we spent a lot of time driving around because it's still an active nuclear power plant. Reactor 5 obviously isn't operational. We were trying to figure out the best way to get in. And the day we were there, there was a, a bunch of military vehicles there. And so, people who know Russian, so O-M-O, -O, the H is pronounced as an N. So that thing says omen. <laughs> but what it is, is actually sort of the, the um, special forces police. Huh. Uh, so they were there. Um, if you, I think if you go to the next slide, you can see the, the thermal camera. So we were outside getting ready to, to cross into this area, and I pulled out the thermal camera, and I saw what eventually was about a platoon of, of uh, special forces police in there. And uh, um, not, we really wanted to get, but we could not figure out how to get access. We, we, we drove around. Um, we got chased at one point in time by uh, the local security 
um, and just wasn't going to happen. And if we looked over the wall, we realized that they smoothed all the sand like on a golf course. So if we had walked oh, across the side, they, they would know. Yeah, yeah. So this trip was a combined trip. So we started there in Kursk, and we decided. And the ultimate goal was to go down to Uzbekistan to a place called Aralisk Seven. I think that's where the next photos start. Yep. So uh, we were going to go to, um, and again, e each of these trips, it's, this is the first time. So after we've gone to a place two or three times, we sort of get to meet the people, and we get better access, and we figure things out. So this was a, a first visit to uh, Uzbekistan and required a, a visa. So we got to Nukus. Uh, our goal was to get to Aralisk 7. Aralisk 7 was also nicknamed Anthrax Island. So Aralisk 7 is, uh, was a former Soviet um, uh, chemical and uh, biological weapons factory. It used to be an island in the Aerial Sea. The Aerial Sea has evaporated. It's no longer an island. And so we got to Nukus, got a taxi. We drove. It was about three and a half hours to Moynok. This is the village of Moynok. We spent three days in Moynok trying to find a local who would drive us the last 160 miles through the desert, which, by the way, takes about six hours because there's no real road. Uh, to try and get to Aerolix 7. And, the, and none of the locals wanted to do it because they said there was a lot of military on the border, it's a, a border between Kazakhstan and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Uzbekistan, and a sort of disputed border area. And they were afraid of losing their car, again, their car repossessed. So we finally found a, a gentleman who would take us. I think the next photo you can see sort of it was very interesting culture. Again, those Soviet style half twin beds uh in the room um no air conditioning and it was hot because you're you know basically in a desert uh, i think the next photo is the bathrooms there's the wonderful bathroom so uh, adventure adventure filmmaking is not glamorous and you just have to learn <laughs> how to, to deal with things i found these really cool little i call them toilet paper tablets they're basically compressed toilet paper sheet and it looks like a a, a large vitamin and i carry those and you can actually get it open with just saliva, but just a little bit of water and it becomes a toilet paper. So you can always carry those with you just in case you don't have toilet paper. Huh. Yep. Um, that's fly paper at the local yes, grocery store covered in flies. Um, so again, very, very different culture, but it was, it was wonderful. The people were very nice. Um, we had a great time, you know, an experience I would, not, you know, I, I cherished a lot. However, so I think the next slide is that that's the vehicle that was older. Yeah, I'm, 50, that car is older than I was. Um, you know, then we drove in that car for five and a half hours to get to the location. You know, we were, the idea is there's, there's, the, there's the laboratory area, and then a kilometer past that is the town where about 1,500 to 2,000 people live. So, you know, next shot. It looks very comfortable. <laughs> when we got to Airless 7, this is what we found. It had been destroyed five days before we arrived. Oh. <laughs> so two or three months worth of planning, you know, satellite reconnaissance images, trying to figure out where we're going to go, how are we going to get there? And we got there and everything was gone. History is gone. And that's sort of, you know, why I like to do this stuff is to document the history. Right. No, no one will ever see this. So we get there and you know, the idea is we would sleep in, we took just enough food for the day. We'd sleep in the buildings. So I didn't bring a lot of warm stuff. We'd film the two locations, then drive back. We were, you know, I reckon myself and our, and our third party were sort of like, oh my God, that all this work. So we also knew that because this used to be a sea, there are abandoned ships further out in the sea. So we figured we we're going to go hike and find those. The issue is that we really weren't prepared. We didn't really have enough water. Now, I, I had a, a satellite phone with me. There's no cell service up here. Um, and, you know, was starting to feel a little bit nervous. And we had to make the decision, do we hike during the day or hike at night? Well, what are you supposed to do when you're in a desert? Hike at night. Mm -hmm. We're like, well, we couldn't see where we were going. and We wouldn't have enough time to film if we hiked at night. So we decided we're going to hike during the day wasn't that bad. It was 85 degrees or so. Um, and we began the hike. And then they go to the next image. So this is one of the ships we came across. This was after about 10 miles of hiking. Um, I was exhausted and I was starting to freak out a little bit about the amount of water I brought with me. We left some water back at the 
the, the, the place where our, our uh, uh, person who brought us up left us. Um, and we told him to meet us back there the next day at, at about, you know, basically about 24 hours later, we gave him a time. Um, and we left some water there. You know, I'm trying to think through how much water I'm drinking. It was a lot warmer than I thought. My gear is heavy. We took a few more breaks. I was I was getting a little bit nervous. So, yeah, the next image. So you can see there, I'm, I'm resting, you know, in the shade of the abandoned ship with sand and hiking in the sand. Anybody who's ever walk, walked across a beach, imagine doing that for about 12 miles one way. It was rough. And then this is an area, I think you were telling me about it, that it used to be a lake, but they used yeah. up all the water. So it was the no, four, something happened. Yeah, so it was the fourth largest lake in the world. And in the 60s, the Russians started irrigating cotton fields. You know, people talk about, you know, the U.S. and slavery. Uzbekistan still has slavery today. Um, and they have cotton fields. And they started by doing this irrigation, the Soviets. And they effectively drained the, the lake. They, they got it past the point where the lake could replenish itself. Um, and they, and they were, diver, instead of diverting water from the lake, they were diverting water that fed the lake as well. And they caused what amounts to one of the world's largest natural disasters. Yeah, so there's another shot of the ship, you know, just covered with sand over the, you know, 25, 30 years that it's been sitting there. Um, so this is my, my, my gear pouring shot. So one of the things I did is, is small HD was, was wonderful and let me their, one of their first uh, Cine 7s that allow me to um, control the red via the, the lens, uh, via the, the screen. And so I was field testing. <laughs> Uh, you can also see the the iPhone iPhone i footage tripod there, which is just a great uh, uh, tripod system. Uh, very lightweight. You know, we got, we had a drone with us, so we took some aerial shots while we were there. And you can see just the vast desert. So it was about 15 kilometers. We get to one set of ships, and we're like, do we get to the next one? Oh, we got to get to the next one. So we go to the next one. We go to the next one, and you're just out in the middle of nowhere. And really, we were unprepared. Um, you know, I'm usually a pretty good Boy Scout, making sure I've got everything. So there's there's me. My friend took me sleeping. So this is my, this is how I keep warm. So I took my my sleeping pad. Um, I took my um, 40 degree uh, camping quilt, and then this. Um, it's effectively Tyvek. It's a it's a bib sack that actually has uh, uh, aluminized fibers in it as well. So it adds another 10 to 12 degrees to your bag. But it's very small and lightweight, and it's breathable, unlike a space blanket, which would keep right. you warm, but you sweat. So I actually one of the, yeah, the best sleeps I had. And so uh, actually, if my wife is still watching, this is where I called her. I, I, you know, I rented a, a satellite phone just in case, and I figured I would paid for the service. I might as well try it out. And I was actually nervous. Um, so, you know, this is the place where I was starting to feel scared. I, you know, even when the guns were pointed at me, I, I you know, I mentioned that I had a great boss who was sort of a mentor, who was also military. And I said, you know what? I wasn't scared when the guns were, you know, uh, was at, you know, pointing in my face. Everything was sort of calm. This was the first time I was ever really sort of worried. So we, we spent the night there. The next morning we got up and it was cold, overcast. So it was 80, 80 85 degrees. The next morning was 40. And I didn't have a jacket. You know, I had a, I think I had a sweatshirt on or whatever, completely unprepared. You know, normally again, being a boy scout would have all the, the vest or whatever else. So I took that bib sack and cut it up and turned it into a poncho. So that's how I kept myself warm and, and this hike back. So we're hiking back. Um, and I started to get nervous, uh, started to calculate my water. Luckily, Eric was with me. Eric was great, made fun of me, but that's okay. I deserved it. Uh, they let me use some of their water. We finally got back to our checkpoint. Our ride wasn't there. Ooh. That's when I started to get a little nervous. I thought to myself, okay. So you can see me with a the poncho there and nothing around. Um, we got to the to the location and we waited about an hour. Luckily, there was water there. started to drink my water. And again, drank more of it than I should have, not thinking that the, the guide was going to show up again, and he didn't. And we were worried. And so that's when I started kicking. Okay, I got the satellite phone. I got the numbers for the U.S. Embassy, the, you know, the Uzbeki Embassy, uh, my, my military contact friends, um, 
you know, I, I, I planned all that stuff out. I'm like, but it's going to take them a day or two to get to us, you know, because Tosh Kent's on the other side of the country. And I started to get nervous. Um, I think you go to the next slide. So that's that says caution border. That's the border between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And that's where our, our guy was supposed to meet us. And he wasn't there. So we decided before we made any phone calls, we were going to hike down back to where the villages were that we are, you know, going to, to, to try and film that were blown up. It's another 10 miles. Um, and this whole time I'm thinking, okay, if I call, how long will it take us? If we can't make it, okay, what things am I going to leave behind? Okay, I'm going to leave some batteries behind, which I actually didn't tell you. I left the tripod head and, and a battery back there to lighten the load by 10 pounds, which made a difference. Um, and so there's a battery, a blue shaped battery sitting in the middle of the Uzbeki desert. Um, we got to that village and thank goodness the guide was there. Our, our ride was there. He did not want to be on the border because there were military patrols and he was afraid that he was going to get his, his car oh. taken from him. So I've never been so happy to see somebody I didn't know in my entire life. Um, we got back in the car, we drove all the way back to, uh, to Moynock. Um, made a phone call, you know, we were supposed to, to leave out from, from Nukus and the airport was closed. So I called the embassy and they said, well, you know, this happens to everyone. So Nukus, the city it's in, there's, I think there's 12 provinces and this is sort of an independent province. So it's sort of like its own country inside of the Uzbek country. And he said, well, the airport usually closes, it's been closed a little longer than normal. So your best bet is to, to drive back to Tashkent, the capital, just 30 hours from where we were. So we got a cab <laughs> and we decided to follow the Silk Road. So we, we, we got a cab and we drove from one side of, of, of Uzbekistan to the other 10 days each day to each of the different cities. And uh, um, the total cab ride was $170. <laughs> I've had Uber rides in New York City that cost yeah, more exactly. than 170, you know. It's like course, going from one side of LA to the yeah. other. And so they're like the fourth largest producer of methane. And so all their vehicles run in methane. So it's like 10 cents a gallon. But the problem is they have this giant tank in their trunk. So there's no room in their trunk for our gear as myself and, and my friend Arik and a, and a third person with us. And so we're all of our gear is sort of piled inside the car as well as some in the trunk. We made these 10 hour drives across the, the country uh, finally got to Tashkent, spent a couple of days in Tashkent, and we went our separate ways. And I, I wind up flying uh, from Tashkent to Moscow, Moscow to Poland, because that's where my original flight was to leave. Uh, this is, again, we, we wind up always running into police or military someplace. <laughs> so this is on our drive across the country. Uh, and they, they, no big issue, but uh, sort of got used to that. And uh, and then uh, one of the greatest things, so we're in Samarkand, which is one of the cities on the way, and we're, we're taking pictures, and there's this group of Uzbekis, um, you know, on a, on a guided tour or whatever. And uh, we asked, can we take, do you want us to take your picture for us? Because they're all trying to take turns taking pictures. And then they said, no, you get in the picture with us. And so we <laughs> went, all three of us got in the picture with, with them. And so this is a madrasa, and it was a, a very interesting. There's actually 32 LCD projectors and, you know, 16 on each side of that building. And at night, they do this show where they basically project across all of those buildings, this amazing audio visual display. Um, so we stayed that night and, and watched it. It was a, just a very, very interesting, culturally very interesting, very different than, than Kazakhstan, very different than, than, than Ukraine, very different than Belarus, even though they were all, you know, one country or one Soviet Union at one point in time. Interesting. Uh, yeah. let's see here. I think we're almost at the end, if I'm that's, not mistaken. That's the last that's one, one there, yep. Uh, yep. other than your slide. But let me yep. find, where do you go? That's at the top. This one, yes. Yep. So tell that story. So, so, that, so we had learned of this piece of, uh, of, uh, core so it's a piece of graphite from the reactor core um in the woods and so we went track tramping through the woods to try and find it um we jokingly said my, my friend Arik, this is a dosi stick patent pending so we got a big stick and tied the dosimeter to the end of it because we didn't want to be anywhere close but it that my dosimeter that one goes to a hundred millisieverts um so 50 millisieverts is the maximum exposure that you want to have in any one year. Uh, in fact, that's what, in fact, the average, the average 
U.S. citizens are supposed to have less than 20, and that's if you work in a nuclear power plant or nuclear medicine, 50 is your max before your uh, amount of cancer, uh, potential for cancer, risk of ha cancer goes up by a couple percentage points. And that's cumulative okay, over time. So this, this actually uh, maxed out my dosimeter. So we got as close as we could, and, and, and it started flashing nines because it maxed out. We stayed there for you know maybe a minute or two and then put the stuff back. I got more exposure to, and it's still within safe limits, obviously, uh, in that you know 40 minute period of time of working with that particle. And then I did the entire cumulative amount over that uh, trip. Wow. So the only other time I had a higher reading was uh, uh, once when, when my wife was with me, we went into the red force and the red force is right next to the reactor. It's where all the stuff from the reactor landed. Um, and the forest turned red, it all died. Uh, and they have three or four burial pits there. And we decided to walk out there and film it. it took us about a, you know an hour to walk there and back. And then again, my wife, are you okay? Is everything fine? Frick it, go. Just, God damn it, just keep going. I knew she was nervous. So, uh, yeah. So that's, you know, that's what it's like to be an adventure filmmaker over the last 10. I've got, you know, several other trips we've got planned, places to go. Hopefully this TV show gets picked up. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an open book. I, I learned a lot going through this process and getting to this point in my career. Uh, and I'm happy to share it with, with anybody because I know there are people like, how's the backpack work? How's the dose similar? What, what lenses did you use? You know, I, I come from an engineering background, so I was sort of methodical about how I tested all this stuff to figure these things out. And if I can help somebody not have to go through 10 years of what I went through to figure these things out, I'm more than happy to, 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 to lend a hand. And sharing is something that, I mean, it's, I really love that about so many people and yourself included that, that yeah. just sharing this information is something we can do these days without having to be, you know, well, that's an industry trade secret. I can't, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's what I love about today. Uh, before we get to your contact info and, and mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions, uh, go ahead and throw them out there. We'll try to get them all answered here. Um, Cause you know, we, we got in here. You might, you might have something you want to ask. Yeah. I mean, and for those who are going to watch it, you know, on the recorded version, I'll have my contact information. They can more than, you know, send me an email if you got questions. I'm always happy yeah. to share. So here's here's his, uh, all his contact information right there. So he's available. He's obviously a nice guy. <laughs> um, I think I think your wife is about an hour behind because her questions were. <laughs> she may have paused it. <laughs> she she may have she may have because she she was she was doing happy hour with her friends that you know social distancing happy hour. Um, so but yes and and you know and I'm now uh, you know I, I yeah like like a lot of people recently um, been laid off from my my daytime job from the last uh, nearly half a decade, uh, but it's it's okay. Um, I think I'm going to focus more on filmmaking and you know. And, and of course, I do a lot in the high tech world in, in uh, cinematography. So I'm I'm happy to uh, to do consulting as well. So, yep. so he's you know, obviously he's an open book and he's he shares a lot. And um, I got to figure out how to go on one of these trips with you. I don't, yeah. I don't know about hiking sixty <laughs> miles. So I, I mean, I've lost a lot of weight, so I, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, your keto stuff is looks. I'm like, oh man, I should really make that, but it's so much easier to get pizza rolls from Geno's out of the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking volunteers for Sherpa duty? Yeah, I we do every once in a while. You know, and that's what happened. That's how Jacob got to go. Is that uh, we had a spot available, and I, uh, you know, and I will. I'll usually do it on one of the forums, like Red Forum. I usually don't do it as public, like on Twitter or general Facebook. Right. But if you're following me, and you know, and and if you want to go, I know a lot of the guides there. Um, we can always plan a trip if we get enough people who want to go. We can always put a trip together. Of course, what, what we're hearing now from our contacts is that the, the zone is closed until October, uh, partially because of the, the, the fires recently and also because of, obviously, the, the pandemic that's going on. Now your wife says you sounded worried in the desert. <laughs> yes, yes. I tried to, you know, I'm usually pretty calm um, about everything, and I, tried, I didn't want her to get worried, but I, I was... It was the one time. It was the one time in my life that I thought, you know what, I may not make it out of here. You know. Uh, thanks for hosting. Thanks for sharing your yeah. insights. How did you get? How did you start your journey as an adventure filmmaker? That, yeah, okay, so uh, yeah. You shared that at the beginning. Yeah. So it started with with Chernobyl back in two thousand and ten. I, you know, my I had a mentor. Uh, I had a a boss who I looked up to as a mentor, and he decided to leave and go sail around the world. 
and I was sort of disappointed that he left. I've been at the company for six years and, you know, and I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to leave. I'm not happy. My wife said, well, go focus on your photography for a year. And so I wound up, you know, leaving that company and, you know, made my way to, to Chernobyl and just sort of became an addiction. And now it's, it's the history, it's the technology, it's the storytelling, it's all those things combined. And it's, you know, would I love to shoot a feature film someday? Sure. It was interesting, but it's, it's really about documenting these stories of people around the world and, and the, and the things that have happened. And I just, I, 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 I sort of get um, drawn to, towards the science and technology of things, mainly I think because I'm, again, I, you know, I studied engineering. I graduated as an engineer, and people go, "What did you learn in engineering?" I learned how to analyze the crap out of everything, <laughs> and so I sort of tried to turn that light back on me a little bit, or that focus back on me. And like, so why do I like what I'm doing? Why do I focus on it? And part of why I like the science and technology, I think, is because it it removes the politics from a lot of these things. Scientists in general and engineers in general try not to get involved in politics. I and mean, we live in a world now that we're hyper-political with everything that's going on, and I get it, and people enjoy it, and people all have their views. And, and I think that's why I like the science and technology, because one plus one equals two. The bridge stands up or the bridge falls down. I tell it's my, my to. Yeah, I, t I tell my, my, my um, sister, who's an accountant, CPA, and a controller for a big company, I said, accounting is social math. You know, what do the books say? Eh, what do you want them to well, say? This chapter says. Yeah. You know, and I think engineering is that, you know, I, I, my wife hates when I say this, but I'm, a, my father was a surgeon, my mother is an artist, and I'm the middle child. And I get this right brain, left brain thing going on all the time. And it's sort of, I think, what's drawn me to, um, to the media industry and film and television is I think it's a, it's a perfect intersection of art and science. You know, I love the, the, the science that enables me to tell these stories, but I like the art of actually having to tell the story with these tools. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions popping through. And honestly, I had written up like 10 questions. Mm -hmm. And between your wife and other people, they all asked those oh, questions. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> And, and we and we went three hours, a little over three hours. We, so yeah, three hours. Yeah. So you you uh, you outdid uh, Chris Vandershaff. Oh, good, you good, outdid, good. Uh, David, well, you're not yet to David Weldon. I think you got about three more minutes to go. So we'll okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just stick around for three minutes. But yeah, I, I mean, Charles that. Pappert went five hours and three minutes. <laughs> I, I ran out of vodka, so you know, and I, I have some sous vide burgers that we're making, so I need to get, oh, get to that. I'm all about the sous vide. Oh what? yeah, yeah. What do you do for charring on your CV? Uh, so I've, I've messed around with a couple different things. So we, I have a, we have a really nice grill. When we moved into the house, there's a grill, and it has a, a searing section. So yeah. I've used that for a couple times. Um, I've tried the cast iron skillet a couple times, yeah. and now I have a Searsall. So tonight we're going we're gonna to try the Searsall. Se Searsall are great, and that's what I used for a long time because mm -hmm. you have a very finite control over it. Now, the best thing I've found now, a cast iron is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, Harbor Freight, mm -hmm. go buy the $39 pear burner, the, the weed burner. Wow. It takes seconds. seconds. I'll have to try that. And it's that. so good. And what I do is I put the, the meat on the grill and mm -hmm. then I use that because it's already designed for high heat. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is, I mean, within about three or four minutes, it's all yeah. done and you that, can completely. That's control. what I, tr I tried to do last time. Is I, I put the searing section on, I put the steak on, I sears all on the one side and I was going to flip it over and sears all the other to get it. Except I forgot that going over top of a searing section on a grill is really hot. <laughs> so I can't, I can't have my hand over top of it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that pear burner, and, and I just turn it on. I don't pull the trigger because if you pull the trigger, it's like toast. Yeah. Just so but what I my mean, wife it's... wants me to do is have something else that creates giant fireballs in the house. It doesn't have to be giant. <laughs> you don't do it in the house. Yeah. It works yeah. out so well. Yeah. Jacob's uh, sending you love. He's yeah. a great person to travel uh, he with. Was, a lot he of was, fun. Yeah, he was fantastic to travel with as well. I definitely he, do that again. He had some stories about his lack of ability to keep up with drinking, though. Yeah, so you have to drink. So here's a great story. Uh, so we're you know, we're in, we're in Chernobyl and, and Arik, my friend has a Land Rover uh, Defender 130, which is the big one. Yeah. It's a semi dream vehicle. I think the one, the 110 has been my dream vehicle. And so the skid plate, one of the bolts on the skid plate broke off. And so we had to get it fixed. So we're in the village of Chernobyl. We, 
got to this like sort of garage area and the, some workers there and like, oh yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll take a look at it. They tried to put it up on the lift and the thing is so big and so heavy, plus all of our gear, the lift really couldn't lift it. So they took it into a pit. So they, they had us come over to like the office area. And so I've got, uh, uh, I'm, I love 5'11 gear and I got a 5'11 hat that they gave me, a special edition hat. And we go in there and they, they, they're always so friendly. They bring out, uh, you know, ham and bacon and butter and bread and, you know, they're always so, you know, want, want to show you a nice time. And then liquor, vodka came out. And the one guy kept pointing at my hat and then going like this, meaning, can, can I have your hat? Souvenir, the only English he knew. And I said, no, nah, I can't, you know, it's the only one of, it's one of a very few hats. So I said, you yeah, know, just a second. So I went back out to the car and I got my, you know, I have like this, this, eat, um, case that I kept all the liquor bottles in and a bunch left over. And I got my red hat, the new silver ones that they made. Yeah. And I brought that back and I opened up this case with all the, yeah, exactly that one <laughs> with all these liquor bottles in it. And, uh, they went and they looked at me and they go, doctor, doctor. Cause that's where you buy liquors at the apothecary. And so I, and they were kept with a doctor and I took the hat and I said, for you, I thought the guy was going to cry. He was like, oh, oh my God. So and I had tequila, I had bourbon. You know, I try to get stuff that they normally wouldn't have. They have vodka. And so we all drank. Again, Jacob had some trouble keeping up with them. And the you drink. gave him the red hat? I gave the guy the red hat. Yep. So, so there's a red hat in the middle of <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. In the middle of Chernobyl, there's a guy running around with a red hat. Because I told I told uh, Jared, I'm like, I need to replace that hat. I think that they ran out of those or they're going to get some more. And so I haven't replaced it yet. You, you um, know, the first time that, that someone – outside that city walks in there that knows about red and they're like, yep. what? <laughs> well, it's funny. I went, I was in uh, New York and I went to go meet with the um, ambassador from Kazakhstan because we were trying to get official permission to go to the, to the shuttles. And I went in there, got an appointment, sat down with him and I, and I, my um, badge, because my, we have an office in New York. So I had my badges for my office and I have it on a red lanyard. And I walked in and he goes, Red, the camera, red. Goes, I go, yeah, he goes, oh, we bought a bunch from B&H and took back to Tashkent. <laughs> so I said, you know, and I told, I told uh, uh, the, the, the team at the time at Red that, you know, for education, I said, if we can structure something while I'm there, I'll do a education class. So we just never got, never got organized. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... Do we beat it? Did we go far enough to beat the other guy? Yeah, we, we, right. we've got Dave Walden done. And good, good. Again, for everybody, here's his contact information. And then uh, Miriam has a, has a great thanks for putting this together. Look forward to hearing more about your TV yeah. show. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to find yeah. out. So Mir Mir Miriam, Miriam is great. She runs the Chernobyl HBO Chernobyl fan page on Facebook. Nice. Um, and she's a, a fan of the show and a super nice lady. And so I've contributed a lot there as well. And like I said, people can follow me. I have my Facebook page. Um, if I don't, if you, you know, you want me to be a friend on Facebook and I don't respond, don't feel bad. I don't do that to everybody. Cause I do, you know, air my political views sometimes. <laughs> I don't like all those <laughs> as well, but you can follow me, you know, if you're in there, obviously in the red, in the red Facebook page. Um, I've got my, my PGP images, Facebook page, as well as there's an exploring the zone Facebook page. I did a while ago that has a lot of stuff from Chernobyl. I've got my Twitter account, my Instagram account. Um, and I think over the next couple of weeks, because of this pandemic and not being able to get out, I'm going to go through the couple hundred hours of Chernobyl footage and sort of do a, a short documentary. That is a tour through the zone for people oh, who've be, never been be really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick asked if you do any classes in Atlanta. Uh, I, I don't, but I'm more than happy to. I love teaching. I've taught at University of Georgia for my old professors, and I'm always looking for opportunities. That, and I've been in consulting for a long time, and I love sharing. And, you know, if somebody wants to arrange a class on something, I'm happy to help out or happy to teach. I do a lot of stuff around uh, IP video, you know, obviously with SIPTI 2021 and 2110, um, and uh, or, yeah, 2022 and 2110. Uh, as well as routing and, you know, all kinds of stuff in the IT and film and HDR and UHD. So, I'm, you know, and I'm always happy when we can get back out to go have a beer with somebody. Yeah, no kidding. And yeah. You and I were supposed to have a beer. We didn't get to catch up last yeah, time. Yeah, I know. I and know. maybe Cinegear in, in the fall? Yeah, yeah, which is going to be weird because it's in the fall, but the fall it's... used to be Cinegear Atlanta, too. Yeah, <laughs> so... I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. It'll be an odd one. Yeah. Um, well, so if you 
aren't following Philip, go out there on all of his social media and follow him. And I mean, he posts the stuff all the time. He just like drops a story every now and then about here's a story here. Here's a, here's a picture there. That's, yeah. it's, it's really how I learned uh, about his work is just seeing his photos. I'm like, Oh my God, this guy's got to know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And like I said, hopefully, yeah. we, hopefully we got a new TV show coming out. We'll see. Like I said, slow motion Russian roulette, but uh, you never know. You know, uh, yeah. this lady would like to know when are you going back to Chernobyl? Yeah, that's that's my wife. She wants <laughs> to know because she got to take care of the dogs. I, so we were supposed to go in May. Uh, we were supposed to go back this May. Um, uh, supposed to take some some people that we all know want to go as well. Um, that keeps getting moved around, and. Uh, so we'll see probably October time frame when the zone opens up again, which is, you know, I've been every single season uh, except dead of winter. I haven't been mid January yet. That's probably too snowy and cold. Um, but uh, probably go back May. Uh, we've got another trip to Kazakhstan planned um, some places in Russia that I want to get to as well. So uh, we're trying to figure it all out. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I, uh, a lot of people on my channel, they, they know the size of my dog and I thought yeah. for sure I had one of the largest dogs mm -hmm. and I was going to absolutely obliterate the size of your dog until I saw the picture of your dog. <laughs> standing yeah. up, and I'm like, that's a Clydesdale. Yeah. A <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bueller's a big boy. He's, he's our second, uh, great period. Our first one was even bigger Schultz. Uh, he was 165 pounds and that's, that's actually, I, 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 I am an internet meme. So there's a picture of anybody who, who who has Great Pyrenees and is you know follows Great Pyrenees, well or follows dog memes. You will see at some point in time a photograph of a person with a giant dog in their lap, giant white dog, and the caption usually says, "When you realize that you've adopted a polar bear." <laughs> so that's that is me and my dog Schultz. My wife took that picture probably about three or four weeks after we adopted Schultz. He climbed up in my lap, and laid there, and the last count, it's been shared four or five million times around the internet. It had its own subreddit. It had its own subreddit at one point in time that somebody <laughs> told me about. Um, and my wife and I are very involved in Great Pyrenees Rescue of Atlanta. We have a foundation as well called the Schultz Foundation. When we lost our, our, our first peer, we built this foundation where we give scholarship to people who adopt Pyrenees and then train them to be therapy dogs because they're just natural therapy dogs. And so yeah, they're very good yep, dogs, actually. Yep. So we have we have Bueller, and then we adopted a little female last year named Lucy, and they're they're both uh, trained to be therapy dogs, and they're actually both trained to be MRI dogs. So our local uh, university, Emory here, one of the one of the uh, professors there, physicians, has been doing an MRI study for I think ten or twelve years now. Um, neural canine neural cognitive cognitivity or something. He's written a couple of books, but he does MRIs of dogs, you know, trying to understand a dog's brain. And so he selects a handful of dogs every year to go through this program to be trained to take an MRI. And so both of our dogs have been trained. Bueller's a bit big, so he never was able to do a successful MRI because he just breathes too much. He gets too, but uh, Lucy, we think is going to do really well. So we'll see. Uh, have you ever had them in a situation where you got to see or witness their herding ability? Well, so they, they're not herders. So they don't do herding. They're livestock oh, yeah. guardian dogs. So their job is to sit there and watch. Well, that's and, interesting. Yep. And so and we've we watched. So we have we have ours is a mix. Mm -hmm. The the parents are next door and they're all mm -hmm. Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. And we watched one day cows came in and got into our field and they herded them out. Oh they yeah. Went side to side on yep. them and walked them out just like yep. a normal herding dog. So wild. yeah, so they're not doing it for herding, they're doing it cuz they're protecting their land. You're not supposed to be here. You had to leave. They left in an orderly fashion. <laughs> yep. Yep. It was wild. I've seen I've seen his protective nature um when we first got Schultz, my uh, sister had has twin girls and they were like 3 years old and they were all playing in the corner and he went over, sat down and watched them. Then they got up, went over to the other corner. He got up, walked over, sat down, and watched them. That's... And he would hear a baby scream or a woman cry on TV, and immediately was up barking. He's like, "I got to protect. Something's going on. I got to protect." Okay, you know? that, that explains more of my my dog's behavior lately. Because, yep. like, my studio is separate from my house. We, mm -hmm. we have to walk across there. Anytime we go, my dog, I let him out, and he runs out in front everywhere and it barks and announces to the mm -hmm. world, "Scott's coming! Scott's yep. coming! Clear the way!" Yep. And then as soon as I get to the studio, then he comes back. I mean, he does yep. it every time. It's yep. so wild. And they and they perimeter. So they they will typically in a new area they will walk the fence line 
and perimeter so they know what they have to guard. We go to a dog park and it's the first thing they'll do is walk around the dog park that's, and make sure he knows what to, what to protect. Wild. Yep. Dogs yep. are cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we love them. I couldn't, couldn't live without them. Yeah. So is there anything that you needed to say or wanted to say that we didn't cover or anything? No, I just, you know, thank everybody for, for listening and watching. And, you know, if there are opportunities for filmmaking and you want somebody who's an adventure cinematographer, I am for hire as well. And I'm always uh, uh, happy to share my insights and things that I've done. Um, so by all means. That's know. awesome. Well, yep. Philip, thank you so much yep. for spending, I mean, three plus hours yeah, of your day. It, it just flew by. It, it did. It was, it was pretty, yeah. I mean, I didn't expect my battery to die. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Yep. And uh, just hang on and I'll uh, okay. uh, close it all out here. So as always, if you have any questions or comments, put them down below. I try to read and respond to all of them. Remember, you can support this channel by using any of the Amazon links or PayPal or Patreon or even Super Chats on these lives. I've got some more live streams coming up. Uh, we've got one on Tuesday. It's a little out of the normal because I've got so many people to add in here. So we've got Phil Holland. He's an absolute amazing cinematographer and he does things that you may not know about. We'll be talking about that on Tuesday. And then Friday, we've got another, another fantastic filmmaker. I'm excited. He's from Australia. So uh, yeah, it's going to be great. So as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>